By the way, uh, I, I'd like to say that uh, I won't be able to be, to follow most of the talks because of the Elfelsberg PKE. So I apologize for that. I All really right. have liked to see the whole session, but um, yeah. All right, Vivek. Uh, can you see it? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we will start in two minutes. I remember you all that uh, the session is uh, recorded. Uh, you automatically allowed for that in your uh, subscription. <coughs> and uh, uh, of course, please keep the <clears throat> keep the uh, microphone uh, off while others are speaking. For questions, they, they will be very welcome. I'll give you um, a warning um, five minutes before the completion of your uh, time. Uh, but uh, um, indeed, I will give you the warning eight minutes before the completion of the 25 minutes the session because uh, we want to leave uh, three, five minutes uh, for questions. Questions can be uh, written on, on the chat uh, or uh, uh, simply uh, just raise your hands and I give you uh, permission to, to speak at the end of each talk. So this was the introduction. Um, I think uh, we are now at the right hour. So uh, welcome you all for uh, attending this uh, session, uh, Neutron Star 3 plus uh, 5, uh, devoted uh, to many aspects of uh, uh, pulsar science and their impacts on uh, physics and astrophysics. Um, the first speaker of this session is uh, uh, Paolo Freire. Uh, so I think that, um, Paolo, you can go ahead. I'll give you uh, eight minutes to the end, uh, but, but please don't use all the eight minutes. Uh, leave some time for the, for, uh, the questions. Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about the timing of uh, 22, 22 minus 0, 137. And uh, part of this is uh, so some introduction and then talking, uh, you know, um, mentioning why we want to do the kind of tests that we want to do, and in particular, why we want to look for dipolar gravitational waves, and then introduce specifically 20 to 22 minus 0 and 37. So what comes before is a little bit of introduction and context so you, people can understand why this pulsar is important. And then uh, finally, uh, consequences for relativistic gravity. So um, I think people have seen the plenary talk by Michelle Kramer. Um, so we have these uh, amazing uh, um, um, tests of uh, general relativity with these binary pulsar. And uh, it, it's really astounding how all the lines in this mass mass diagram come together. He explained how we, you know, how these are derived. These are derived assuming GR. And uh, in particularly, we have a fantastic uh, um, test of the, uh, um, uh, in the emission of gravitational waves, so the radiative properties of gravity. So these match the GR prediction to within uh, 1.3 times 10 to minus four. Um, to and this is a 95% uh, in confidence interval, uh, which means that this radiative test is now 25 times better than possible with the whole stellar pulsar. Uh, it's, it's so precise in, the, in, in fact that the next to leading order contributions to gravitational emissions are uh, becoming uh, similar or even larger than the measurement error. So this is very impressive. So the question then is what is there left to do in pulsar astronomy after that? And uh, one of the answers, as other uh, people in this session are going to talk about other um, possible uh, uh, other interesting topics, but one of the answers is tests of the strong equivalence principle. Um, we are mostly familiar with the weak equivalence principle and the Einstein equivalence principle. So both are tested to very high precision with the microscope satellite. So this implies test masses that are, uh, so they're very small. They don't have significant self-gravitational uh, energy. 
And uh, uh, the fact that this is so well tested implies that most alternative theories of gravity have to incorporate these results somehow. Uh, basically, that uh, if you are in, in free fall, the space time around you is basically uh, described by the Minkowski metric of the special relativity. Uh, and most of these metric theories of gravity incorporate this by uh, describing uh, uh, gravity as curved space time. So then they have some metric that describes this curvature. The strong equivalence principle, however, is, is quite special. Um, uh, unlike general relativity, all viable alternative theories of gravity predict the violation of the strong equivalence principle. This is, this is a really important point. Um, uh, what happens if the, there is a violation of the strong equivalence principle? Uh, the main consequence would be a violation of the universality of free fall for, gravitation, for gravitating objects. Um, this would have two, this particular thing, the violation of the universality of free fall has two observable consequences. One of them is the orbital polarization of uh, uh, in an external gravitational field. And this is proportional to the difference between the coupling, the scalar charge of the pulsar and the white dwarf companion, if we have a pulsar and the white dwarf, and the emission of dipolar gravitational waves. So we have a, here a pulsar and the white dwarf. I'm mentioning specifically pulsars and white dwarfs because if you have two pulsars with identical masses, the, these, these terms could be zero and then you have no observable effects, not even, the, even in very high precision systems like the double pulsar. So um, the, uh, the fun of high, uh, hunting for these effects is that you, you always achieve something. So if you detect them, you falsify GR. So that's, that would be a big deal. Uh, we haven't done that, but uh, by not detecting them, we can constrain alternative theories of gravity. So um, about the first thing, the orbital polarization, so I'd, uh, like Michael did, again, I'll publicize this paper um, where uh, we have used the triple system to obtain a, a limit on the delta parameter, which is the measures the differential acceleration. Uh, of the pulsar and the companion white dwarf. And we see that their accelerations in an external field, uh, the difference in those accelerations is smaller than two times 10 to minus six. Um, uh, unlike previous studies, we have no systematic effects. Uh, and this, um, and it's partly, this happens partly because we take the finite size of the orbit into account in our, in our timing. Uh, means that we have these kin uh, kinematic uh, effects on uh, X and uh, omega dot and all that. So this is this was a really interesting test, but what I'm going to talk about today is looking for gravitational uh, dipolar gravitational waves. So in some early experiments, we used pulsars like uh, uh, 0348 plus 0432, which is here in scale with the double pulsar and the whole stellar pulsar. Um, the orbital period is the same as the that of the uh, uh, double pulsar, two hours twenty seven minutes. It's a bit of a coincidence. So we look at this um, um, pulsar white dwarf system. An interesting uh, thing is that the white dwarf can actually be seen and it's quite bright, it's, you can see it there. And we can look at the spectrum uh, of these and study these uh, with using uh, atmosphere models and we can get the mass of the white dwarf with some good precision, 0.17 solar masses. Also, we can get phase result spectra. So as the orbit progresses, we can see the, the, the radial velocity of the star changing and we can determine its orbital velocity of about 2 million kilometers per hour. And from the ratio between uh, this speed of the white dwarf and the speed of the pulsar, we get a mass ratio of about 11.7, and you can get the mass of the pulsar to good precision. And uh, uh, now we have the mass of the pulsar, the white dwarf, we have the orbital characteristics, and we can make a prediction for the orbital decay of minus 8.1 microseconds per year. Uh, of course, this system has been very important, of course, for testing. Uh, uh, um, the equation of state ex ex excludes a lot of the uh, equations of state of dense matter. Uh, so that, that is an additional reason why we want to do this kind of work. Anyway, for two of these systems, we could um, do, uh, and uh, actually this comes in the sequence of earlier work for 1141 minus 6545, a paper, uh, 2008 paper by Bat et al. But for these two systems, we could really make precise measurements of the orbital decay, and we have this, this comparison with the with these, uh, um, and it matches the, the GR predictions. Um, one of the, the things about these, these, these systems is that um, uh, if you, um, 
look at them. Uh, so they, they constrain the, the deviation. So they constrain the emission of dipolar gravitational waves. So they, they certainly don't there. But the interesting thing is that if you look at the, the limits imposed by these pulsars, so um, uh, 1738 is that uh, lower, uh, that dark, that triangle on the lower left, and the 0348 is that triangle on the right. Um, so if you look at these constraints, they, they still allow an increase in the uh, theoretical increase in the uh, middle section. Uh, so for the design for the uh, more as positive far as the theories of gravity, they can still have for intermediate masses uh, a large increase in the um, um, the emission of dipolar gravitational waves and it is effectively on the effective scalar coupling. Uh, this is uh, called it's been called the scalarization gap and it was first pointed out by in this paper by Shibata et al. So basically what we need is we need some pulsars in the middle where we can do some um, uh, tests of uh, uh, gravity theories to see if we can exclude this behavior. The first of these was found uh, uh, by in the P alpha uh, survey with uh, by Einstein at home, and the, it was the the system is published by Lazarus et al. in 2006, and then uh, it has a pulsar it has a spin period of 27 milliseconds, orbital period of near four hours, and a relatively low orbital eccentricity. Uh, so it's we think it's a Double neutral, uh, double neutral star system. And, the, and recently in this paper here that you can see by Ferdman et al, we were able to measure several of the post Keplerian parameters for this system. And uh, it is quite an interesting system. So the mass, uh, total mass of this system makes it the most massive double neutral star in system in the galaxy, a few percent, three or three percent uh, more massive than the whole stellar pulsar. And the interesting part is that the mass of the pulsar is 1.62 solar masses and the companion is about 1.27. Uh, so um, this makes it an asymmetric system, uh, uh, of, although it's two neutron stars, but they're quite uh, different in their binding energies. So it makes them interesting for uh, uh, tests of the dipolar gravitational wave emission. But more interestingly, the pulsar mass puts it in that uh, gap that I was telling you about earlier, the scalarization gap. Despite all of this, the um, uh, orbital decay in this system uh, is uh, as uh, agrees with GR. So that is first first datum. Um, this system is also interesting because um, you can see here there's the, the number on the horizontal axis is the um, uh, fraction of uh, double neutron star systems that have this kind of mass asymmetry. The discovery of this single system, because we don't know that many double neutron star systems where we can measure the masses precisely, um, just the discovery of this particular system implies that there's about a 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 a fraction of such asymmetric binaries, which probably has some implications for, for uh, LIGO and Virgo, uh, interpretation of LIGO and Virgo events. So now we come to uh, 22, 22 minus 0, 137. So um, it was discovered in the same survey that found uh, 0348. So that very massive pulsar I was telling you about. Um, the spin period is similar, 32.8 milliseconds. The orbital period is, is it's a wider system. Or orbital period is 2.4 days. So it's quite a broad system. The eccentricity is very low. So it means that the companion is likely a white dwarf. And the DM is three. So it's very nearby. So it's, that was a, a thing that makes it initial, immediately interesting. Um, uh, so there was a detailed timing study of this by Konya et al. in 2017. But before, um, there is this study um, the, that motivated by the low DM of the pulsar. Um, uh, there was this VLBI study by uh, Adam Deller et al. that had already shown that the uh, the distance to the pulsar can be measured very precisely. So it's 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 267 plus or minus one parsec. So this is the most precise VLBI distance that uh, for any pulsar. Um, um, there's uh, uh, fourth, uh, there's a pulsar in southern hemisphere that's more more precise distance overall, but that's using the PV dot. Um, anyway, so we have been testing this 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 system for quite a long time. So you can see on the lower left the initial GBT measurements from the discovery team, and then you can see here from Effelsberg, Nancé, and Jodo Bank the timing that has been done with the European telescopes ever since. So we've been uh, looking at it for long, and we can confirm that there is a strong Shapiro delay. It's very precise, uh, unusually precise actually. Masses just from Shapiro delay. Um, 
uh, and the, and the, just from that, you can get the pulsar mass of 1.81 solar masses plus or minus 0 0.03, and the companion mass of 1.31 uh, solar masses. So these, these values are consistent with what you obtained in 2017 from uh, Cognac et al, but more precise. Uh, on top of that, we can measure the uh, periastron advance. And taking that and other effects into account, we get to refine masses of one. Uh, so the pulsar mass is 1.83 plus or minus 0 0.01. The companion is actually slightly higher than I said before. It's close to 1.32. And the total mass of this system is 3.15 solar masses. It makes it the most uh, massive double degenerate system we know in our galaxy. And the uh, inclination uh, is quite high, so 85.26 degrees. So this is one of the reasons why this system is so, um, um, it's the Shapiro delay is so strong, is because of this high inclination. One of the things that's really interesting about this system, as I mentioned, is that uh, so uh, it has very good timing precision. Uh, so we can measure the orbital decay uh, or the or variation of the orbital period. And that basically agrees with the sum of kinematic effects and the, uh, that, we, that can be estimated for the system and the quadrupolar gravitational wave decay. So the reason why we can measure this, um, uh, so this is from the recent paper by Guo, by uh, Yanjin Guo uh, et al. Um, the reason why we can measure these kinematic effects so precisely is because of the in incredibly precise distance that we get from VLBI. So this is a really, uh, so although the expected orbital decay, uh, both in GR and alternative theories is, is, is weak, uh, we can measure these kinematic corrections and measure the orbital decay itself with very good precision. So this really, uh, we can see that there, there is a really good match. And also that, of course, we have uh, excess uh, uh, of the, uh, so the difference between the, uh, the observed and the predicted uh, co components is, is absolutely tiny. So this is a very strong constraint on dipolar gravitational waves. By the way, uh, this uh, difference is uh, also uh, um, uh, is so small that it actually is one of the best tests of the variation of Newton's gravitational constant. And uh, uh, so um, that for that reason, uh, this will also be a, a result that will come out of this, this, this system. Then mention, I'll mention briefly the, some consequences for relativistic gravity of that measurement. So uh, there's this uh, 2017 paper by Xiao uh, et al on the, uh, how the, the work is done. So this is a work where we try to constrain the, um, um, this phenomenon of spontaneous scalarization, or as they call it, non-perturbative effects in, in the actual gravity that operates in nature compared to the predictions of GR. And uh, they are the one, so there's a renewed version where we have this plot that is the plot that we had before the, the recent experiments. And if we introduce the, the new experiments, you see uh, which are in, in red. So 22, 22 is the one, the, the red triangle more to the center. Uh, the, the asymmetric double neutron star is 10, 19, 13 plus 11, or two are uh, a little bit to the left. And you also have the, the double pulsar there on the lower left. So if we introduce these new experiments, we really get rid of this, this gap. So basically, this whole phenomenon of spontaneous scalarization, which is a, actually a broad prediction, many theories of gravity might 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 be able to, to have this 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 deviation from from um, from GR uh, are not um, are not predict are not observed. By the way, these different curves mean different equations of state because we don't know what's the real equation of state. We can try several of them, and, and we always get the same thing. No matter what is your equation of state, we get this this behavior. So uh, well, yeah. Eight minutes, including uh, questions. Yeah. So the, I'm coming to the end. So um, the radiative test of the double pulsar agrees with GR to uh, 1.3 times to minus four. Despite that, that there's other many other interesting tests of uh, gravity theories that we can do with pulsars. Uh, so I mentioned for the triple system, uh, we know that uh, universality of free fall applies to one uh, to a mass a neutron star mass of that mass to at least two parts in 10 to, uh, 10 to 6. Um, um, we can alternatively look for emission of dipolar gravitational waves. We've done many experiments with different masses. We don't see uh, any sign of that. 
This means that gravitation waves are purely quadrupolar as expected from GR. So there's no, no dipolar component. So this is really a test of the nature of gravitational waves. We don't see spontaneous scalarization for the observed neutron star mass range. So this is the main point from the study of 2222. Even more extreme systems have already been discovered. So I really, the, the talk by Andrew Cameron is, is an example, uh, which will be even more tests, more stringent tests of gravity theories and nature of gravitational waves. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paolo. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Very nice talk. So it's time for questions. Uh, please uh, raise your hands. Yeah, I see. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation of the name. <coughs> Yuta. Uh, Yuta. It's Yuta. My okay. name is Yuta, if you mean me. Uh, Yuta. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much uh, for this very interesting talk, uh, Olu. But uh, I would like to address this point of no spontaneous scalarization. And um, I was wondering, uh, we, we, we do know that uh, when we allow for a mass of the scalar field, we evade uh, many of these uh, constraints for zero mass uh, spontaneous uh, scalarization. Uh, did you include a mass uh, in these uh, 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 calculations that you did to say there is no spontaneous scalarization, or do we still evade uh, uh, this uh, these uh, experimental observational results, or so, do you have uh, a certain um, <clears throat> limit for the mass? Yeah, so this is the mass of the scalar field. So uh, these calculations are done strictly in the um, um, framework of the Damour Esposito. Uh, Farese theories, but the observational limits apply to any theory. So it doesn't matter which theory you try. Uh, if there is in such a theory a prediction for, for the increase in dipolar gravitational waves, we can exclude it. So, so although the curves from these limits are strictly from DEF, which is massless, it, the, the experimental limits will constrain any theory that predicts this increase in the emission of dipolar gravitational waves. So I think it is understandable, right? So, so if if you put if you have um, a massive scalar field um, uh, that you know where, where the neutron stars also emit uh, that makes them also emit extra dipolar gravitation waves, this is also these will also get excluded. Okay, so when we have to uh, evaluate uh, the dependence uh, on the mass of the emission of this uh, dipolar uh, radiation. That's right. Yeah, or dipolar, or or even the, the, there's a quadrupolar term also associated with the with this uh, di, uh, uh, scalar charge, and so the, the the point is that it doesn't matter which theory you have. If if, if you have um, it, the emission of this for any neutron star mass and any equation state, it doesn't matter. It's it's excluded, and that that, that is really the beauty of the result. I mean. People, some, some, some referees got the point wrong about this. Oh, you're only excluding a tiny uh, um, uh, parameter space within the Damour positive for as a gravity, because we only, these theories only for beta naught equals minus 0.4, 4.5 and so on. So it's a very restricted range where you have this blow up that you observe here in between. Oh yeah, but, but this is a different parameter. I mean, uh, uh, we yeah. also, so the, uh, uh, when we allow for mass, we uh, allow for different uh, values of this parameter. So this is also very That's much- right. so, 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 so you can also constrain those theories in principle, you just check how many dipolar gravitation, what is the amount of uh, effective scalar charge and how many dipolar gravitational waves result from that. So if you do those tests and then you can exclude that basically. Yeah, okay, but, but this means this still has to be done uh, in order to compare with these uh, calculations. Mm -hmm and your observations. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jutta. Uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, I had my hand up. Can I, can I ask? <laughs> I, sorry, I didn't see that. Um, yeah, so... Now I see. Go ahead, Vivek. Thank you. Um, very nice talk, Paolo. Uh, I just had a, a 
uh, question about uh, this plot. Uh, I, I think you already answered from the previous uh, question, but is this just for beta naught equals minus 4.5 and uh, the, the y-axis is just alpha naught? Um, so uh, no, this is uh, the maximum you can get for any particular equation of state. So the, the, um, this, the largest effective scalar coupling that is allowed, uh, so there's a, basically a search in beta naught space for the largest uh, beta naught that's allowed for any particular uh, for any particular equation of state here. So it's kind of a worst case scenario. Okay. Thanks. So so um, yeah. So this is going to be in this paper by Zhao and Zhao. Thank you. Thanks, Vivek. Let me check if there are other. And um, no, I cannot uh, see other hands reason. Um, so what, since we have another minute, so what's your dreamt uh, system, uh, Paolo, for uh, uh, improving these uh, kind of constraints uh, even more? This, this system is, is, is fantastic already. Um, and so we're going to continue timing it. Uh, it's going to be one of the best, but I think everyone dreams about the pulsar black hole system because that allows you to test uh, this kind of theories because black hole ha will have no scalar charge at all because of the no hair theorem. Uh, so, uh, so that will be one thing. So a compact pulsar black hole, preferably eccentric, so you can measure the masses, well, it will be. Um, the, the other thing is that this kind of system will test, uh, allow us to test other kinds of uh, 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 gravities like Gauss-Bonnet gravity and so on, because the, in those theories, it's the black hole that has scalar charge, not the, not the pulsar. So that, I think that would be everyone's dream, right? <laughs> yeah, o also for this reason. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, yeah. And uh, now you may, Perfect, and share your screen. And it's time for Andrew uh, Cameron. Please share your, uh, your screen. I'll warn you uh, when uh, eight minutes will be left for uh, completing your talk and uh, uh, answering uh, the questions. All right, let me just minimize the video window. Okay, well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I'm Andrew Cameron, postdoctoral researcher at Swinburne University of Technology and also working with the Osgrove Center of Excellence for Gravitational Wave Discovery. And today I'll be talking about news and views regarding pulsar J1757 minus 1854, a highly relativistic binary pulsar. Now I'm hoping that most people in here will at least have heard of this pulsar before, but in case you haven't, here's the quick crash course. Uh, it was discovered in 2016 by the HTRU Southern Galactic Plane Pulsar Survey taken with the Parkes Telescope uh, of the southernmost inner region of the galactic plane. Uh, the pulsar itself is a 21.5 millisecond recycled pulsar in a 4.4 hour highly compact, highly eccentric orbit uh, with an eccentricity of 0.606. And you can see just how compact and eccentric that is on the schematic on the right hand side. Uh, the pulsar's orbit is shown on the bottom right scale with the sun and also the Hulse-Taylor and double pulsars. So you can see we sort of combined the compactness of the double pulsar with the eccentricity of the Hulse-Taylor. Uh, the pulsar is orbiting a neutron star companion, but we've not picked up any pulsations from that companion uh, to date. And I'll come back to that in a few slides time. Uh, we've measured five post-Keplerian parameters so far from this pulsar and it holds a number of extreme records. Uh, for example, the highest acceleration seen in a double neutron star, the highest relative velocity at periastron between the two objects, the highest rate of orbital decay due to gravitational wave damping, and one of, if not the deepest probe of neutron star space-time curvature. So it's an object of many extremes. Uh, and we find that interesting because as a compact, highly eccentric double neutron star, this particular pulsar has the potential to open up some new territory in testing of gravitational theories. For one, uh, we think it'll be a useful test for lens tearing precession. Now, the graphic you can see on the right is from a scenario of testing this lens tearing precession effect in an Earth orbit frame. Now, if you want to know more about that, you can see um, Ignacio Cefalini's talk at tomorrow's plenary session. Uh, we are trying to pick up this in the context of the pulsar's orbit, uh, and we hope to do that by measuring changes in the semi-major axis uh, of the precession of the pulsar's orbital plane. 
if we did make that measurement, it would be one of the first made in a double neutron star, and it would hopefully provide some constraints on the neutron star moment of inertia, as well as on the neutron star equation of state, both of which are extremely rare. Uh, but the ability that we have to measure this depends upon the misalignment angle between the spin vector of the pulsar and the orbital angular momentum vector, which I will discuss later on in this talk. Another major one that we hope to make a measurement of is the post Keplerian parameter describing the relativistic orbital deformation, also referred to as delta theta. Uh, the plot on the right-hand side of the little animation shows the practical effect of that. It transforms the classical uh, elliptical orbit uh, to one that is slightly more egg-shaped, as shown there in the blue. Now, the delta theta parameter's measurability scales, uh, the magnitude of it scales with eccentricity, so we're doing well on that front. You can see on the plot on the left that we're reasonably high up the vertical scale, um, but the time signature looks a lot like gamma, and so in order to separate the two effects, you need the orbit to rotate, so having a higher omega dot means that you can separate the effects more quickly, and We've sort of got the best of both worlds in that regard, a high eccentricity and a reasonably high omega dot. And so we expect to exceed the performance of the Holtz-Taylor pulsar in this regard considerably because they've got the eccentricity, but only a low omega dot. They've only got to about a two or three sigma detection of this quantity in 40 something years of timing the Holtz-Taylor pulsar. Meanwhile, uh, because the uh, double pulsar has got the higher value of omega dot, they are getting to that value measurement of roughly approximately now. Um, but it's still only at a very weak significance. So we hope to be roughly competitive with the double neutron star in this regard. And a measurement of either one of these would provide some brand new and fairly rare tests of general relativity. So as far as how we're monitoring this pulsar, we've been tracking it for the past several years as part of an international campaign. That of course started with Parkes, the Discovering Telescope, uh, with Effelsberg in Germany and the Lovell Telescope at Jodrell Bank in the UK joining in quickly thereafter. But the work, the uh, major share of the observations done for this pulsar have been taken with the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, which to date uh, since, October, uh, since August of 2016 has made uh, observations of at least 22,000 TOAs by far the lion's share. We get one orbit at both L and S band from that telescope every two months, and we expect that campaign to continue into the immediate future. Uh, Meerkat, as of March 2019, has also joined the party. Uh, we're currently getting full orbit observations every three months with the L band receiver, and we are awaiting the start of a major campaign once the S band receivers for Meerkat are online, which is hopefully coming very soon. And I'll talk about that a little later. So to come to some initial results, uh, these are the updated uh, orbital and other timing parameters for this pulsar. So you can see the orbital parameters up here showing uh, the latest uh, precision that we have on those measurements. Uh, we have the new post Keplerian parameters down here showing that we have uh, five so far, uh, the omega dot periastron advance, the Einstein delay gamma, the orbital period derivative and the Shapiro delay characterized by the orthometric parameters. Uh, those post Keplerian parameters are shown in the mass mass diagram on the right uh, under the general general relativity sorry general relativity characterization, and you can see that four of those parameters intersect to within about one sigma at this point here, giving us our current mass measurements with a pulsar mass of 1.34 solar masses, a companion that is slightly heavier at 1.39 and a highly inclined system at 85 degrees. Notably, however, the PB dot value is beginning to diverge significantly from the intersection of the other four. Now, spoiler alert, we're not breaking general relativity here. There is an explanation for that that I'll come to in a couple of slides time. Uh, one thing that we're also doing at the same time is that we are trying to search for the companion neutron star. This is work being led by Alessandra Rodolfi and Andrea, uh, both from INAF. Uh, because if we can detect uh, pulsations from the companion neutron star, as per the example of the double pulsar, it would greatly enhance the system's scientific potential. Now, the ideal technique for doing that is, of course, to calculate the companion orbit and remove the effect of it from your uh, search mode data. Uh, and uh, the companion orbit is reasonably easy to calculate in this case. Uh, the um, orbital period, eccentricity, and time of periastron advance, sorry, time of periastron passage are all the same as the pulsar orbit. The uh, periastron angle is just a 180 degree switch from the pulsar. Uh, the critical parameter is the semi-major axis, which depends upon the masses of both the pulsar and the companion, which in this case are reasonably well known. Once you've calculated that companion orbit, we then use a Python package called Pisolator, which was written by Alessandra Rodolfi. 
uh, for the purpose of demodulating Presto search mode time series, which removes the effect of the orbital modulation as shown on the left to produce what appears to be an isolated pulsar on the right, making your search that much easier. So our search strategy goes as follows. We take our search mode data and demodulate it uh, according to the companion orbit at different trial values of the mass ratio Q, because although the masses are known reasonably well, there's still some wiggle room in there. So we run a search over the parameters listed on the slide. For then each for each Q trial, we then apply a Fourier transform to each uh, search mode observation and then progressively stack the Fourier spectra because having removed any orbital effects, you should get a clean, uh, very narrow detection of the a pulsar should it be there in a one or two Fourier bin so that stacking them on top of each other should result in a stronger overall detection. And you can see an example of this from this technique applied to the pulsar that we already know about in this system. So if I hit the animation here, you can see that as we add more search mode data Fourier spectra together, the fundamental frequency of the pulsar increases quite significantly in Fourier space, and you can then apply standard search techniques like harmonic summing, et cetera, to this enhanced Fourier spectra to try and pick up at the presence of any companion. Now, as far as the data set that we're searching, we have coherently de-dispersed data from Green Bank spanning uh, two different backends, Guppy and Vegas, at two different frequencies, both L and S. So we've got about 80 hours at L band per backend and about 110 hours per backend at S band. But the total amount of data isn't just adding up all those numbers. There's quite a bit of overlap in those two backends where they were observing simultaneously. So it's roughly about two thirds the size of what it would appear just by adding up those numbers. Uh, and that search is currently ongoing. Unfortunately, we haven't made any detections of a companion just yet, but rest assured, if we do, you'll hear about it fairly promptly. Uh, one thing that we can update since our last major report on this pulsar a few years ago is that we are now able to measure the proper motion of the pulsar as shown in the plot on the right hand side, uh, showing the measurability of each of the proper motion components as uh, a function of the observing time from the Green Bank Telescope. Uh, in red is shown the right ascension component of the proper motion, which comes in nicely at about 4.36 milli arc seconds a year. Uh, less constrainable has been the proper motion in declination due to the fact that this pulsar is very close to the ecliptic plane. Uh, it's leveled out at about minus 0.8 milli arc seconds per year, but it's still got a way to go before it's properly constrained. That said, because it's close to zero, we are now, now able to get a reasonably well constrained estimate of the total proper motion of about 4.4 milli arc seconds per year. Given that measurement, we're now, now able to come back to that earlier point about the divergence of PB dot and what is causing that. Uh, the plot on the right shows as a function of distance, uh, the excess PB dot, uh, that excess is calculated by the given equation where you take your observed PB, uh, sorry, take your observed PB dot value and subtract each of the contributing components. Uh, those are of course the intrinsic GR contribution calculated here from the intersection of omega dot and gamma. Uh, we have the galactic potential contribution uh, taken here from Macmillan 2017, uh, which is dependent both upon the distance to the pulsar and its position on sky. Uh, and the last contribution comes, comes from the Shklovsky effect, which, uh, comes, uh, which is dependent both on the pulsar's proper motion and once again on its distance. Now, if you want uh, this test to be useful and for general relativity to pass the test, you want the resulting uh, excess value to be consistent with zero. And you can see from the schematic on the right hand side that there's a range of distances where that is possible. But the largest uncertainty contribution to this test is that we just don't have a good idea of how far away this pulsar is, which is providing a fundamental limitation on our ability to undertake the, the uh, radiative test of gravity with this pulsar. Uh, for example, if you take the NE2001 DM distance to this pulsar, it comes out at about 7.4 kiloparsecs, which looking at the curve on the right seems reasonably inconsistent with what we're seeing. The YMW16 DM distance model comes out with a distance of 19.6 kiloparsecs, which is way down the end of the scale and once again seems relatively inconsistent. In theory, you could turn around the measurements that we've actually made using this uh, curve here with its one sigma error to estimate what distance the pulsar is at under the assumption of GR and you get a distance here of about 8.5 to 14 and a half kiloparsecs but that is far less useful than actually knowing the distance and being able to use that to properly test GR. So this does unfortunately slightly limit the pulsar's usefulness in the radiative test of gravity. 
One other thing we've been trying to do recently is look for the presence of geodetic precession. That is, of course, the precession of the pulsar spin vector caused by the coupling between a misaligned spin vector and the orbital angular momentum of the pulsar. Uh, that should cause um, a precession, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied here. Let me try that again. According to general relativity, we expect a precession rate for this pulsar of about 3.08 degrees per year, giving in a time scale for a complete rotation of about 117 years. And that should cause a measurable profile change over long enough time scales. Here shown in the example of uh, pulsar J1141, where uh, given time on the vertical axis, we can see a changing profile over the course of several years. So we've gone looking for that. Uh, our initial technique has been to take all of the green bank data that we have, uh, uh, where the green bank observation has covered the majority of one full orbit, and we fit using the PSR part, sorry, the PSR archive package PARS, a three component model to each pulse profile. And you can see that on the right hand side, you've got the actual pulse profile shown in red. Uh, the three component model is shown by the magenta and blue curves with the overall sum of the standard given in the green. So we fit that to every uh, pulse profile. We then subtract that pulse, the standard profile to get the RMS of the residual profile once the standard's been subtracted out. Uh, you then identify the position of the primary peak, the secondary peak, and the intercepts at 10 and 50% of the pulse height using the analytical standard that you fit and work out the uncertainty on both the amplitudes and positions using the measured uh, off pulse RMS. Uh, using the diagram shown on the right hand side, the amplitudes uncertainty is just given by the RMS value and the intercept uh, uncertainty is given by taking the plus minus values and working out where they intercept with the profile. From that, we get an approximate measurement of a profile like this where the peaks are shown in black with the one sigma uncertainties and the 50% uh, height is shown in red and the 10% height is shown in blue. From that, we are able to get measurements with uncertainties of the peak separation, the peak amplitude ratio, and the width at 10 and 50% of the pulse height. And given all of that, we then go looking for any apparent change in the profile. Um, so here we see just for the S-band, we've done this for both L-band and S-band, but I'm just gonna show the S-band data for now. Uh, this is the changing uh, peak ratio over time. Uh, and we see very little evidence of any trend there, except uh, a flat trend. Uh, down here is the uh, peak separation. And there is the weakest indication of possibly a slight decrease in the separation with time, but it's still very much buried in the uncertainty. So we can not say that there's any real trend there either. There's the changing width of the pulse profile at 10% of the height with again showing a flat trend. And the same is again true of the changing width at 50% of the pulse height. So what does this mean? The fact that we so far have not apparently seen any strong change in the pulse profile over the course of several years, roughly uh, you know, four to five years in this case. Uh, well, it could mean one of many things. Uh, for one, it may mean that the pulsar spin vector and its orbital angular momentum vector are more closely aligned than previously thought. Simulations of how this pulsar came to be in terms of its progenitor supernova explosion indicated that there would most likely be a strong misalignment between those vectors, but it may be the case that that is not uh, true. If that is so, it will affect the measurability of length Turing precession, which relies again on that misalignment and it will in feed back to affect and the models that we have of this system's binary formation. Alternatively, it may just be that we are at an unfavorable precession phase as per the diagram on the right, uh, from Bales 1988, which shows uh, precession in the Hulse Taylor pulsar. So the precession phase is given on the horizontal axis. The parameter on the vertical is essentially an analog for the amount or the rate of profile change measurable at any given precessional phase. Uh, and the different curves show you different estimations of the changing profile that you can measure for different misalignment angles. And so obviously with a greater misalignment angle, you get a more dramatic change, but there are still certain precession phases near zero and 180 degrees, where no matter what your misalignment angle is, you're going to have a hard time measuring any change at all. So it might be that we're just at an unlucky point during the pulsar's precession. Or, and perhaps most likely here, our technique just isn't sensitive enough yet. So to that end, we are looking at doing a reanalysis and that's currently underway uh, using a technique uh, used by Padmanabha. Sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that really badly. 
uh, wherein uh, the Pulsar J1022 had a similar analysis done where the peaks of the pulse profile were fit using uh, iteratively fitted parabolas to get a much finer measurement on the position of those peaks and their uncertainties. Uh, and we're also working on incorporating polarization information. Uh, we've got a calibration effort underway by Haley Wall and Maura McLaughlin at West Virginia University who are working on calibrating the entire Green Bank data set. So watch this space because this study is still ongoing and there may be some more news to report soon. Andrew, eight, yep. eight minutes to, to Thank go, you. Including, including questions. All right, so as far as next steps go, the big one that's coming up soon is that we're going to have the Meerkat S-band observations coming up. We're expecting Meerkat, sorry, Meerkat to be playing an increasingly important role in the monitoring of this pulsar in the coming months and years. Uh, so looking at the current timing that we can get, you can see the me if you take um, the data that we get across the full band of the Green Bank L band and S band as compared to the full Meerkat L band, uh, we integrate that data over 60 second integration times and take a TOA from each of those 60 second integrations. We get a mean TOA error from each of those configurations that is fairly similar looking at the table on the right. And also taking a large set of TOAs and working out the, the weighted root mean squared error, you get again a fairly similar number, even despite the fact that Meerkat gets an almost factor of two boost uh, in one hour on the signal to noise compared to Green Bank at the L band frequency. The reason for that is, is that Meerkat's L band is significantly lower in frequency than what we get with Green Bank, and that's where the scattering starts to get significantly worse. So Meerkat's timing precision for this pulsar is currently significantly limited by scattering. That The S band will naturally fix that problem quite a bit. We've got uh, indications of that already from the results of Kramer et al. 2021. Uh, showing the decreasing scattering time scale as you go up in frequency. And by the time we get to S-band, it should almost be gone entirely. Uh, and also we see from work by Spiegelark et al, uh, which is coming out hopefully soon, that the pulsar has a relatively flat spectral index of only minus 1.3, meaning that we won't lose that much in terms of flux at the higher frequencies that the Meerkat S-band receivers will be using. Now that deployment is currently underway, and I imagine we'll hear a little bit more about that in the follow-up talks from this one. Um, so we're expecting some good results to come out of that fairly soon. As far as the two big tests that I outlined at the start of this talk, measurements of length during precession and delta theta, uh, I've run some simulations to try and predict how soon those measurements will be possible. That's based upon an extrapolation of the current Green Bank campaign, as well as a slightly optimistic estimation of the planned Meerkat S-band campaign, estimating one full orbit observed every two months, um, with a similar timing configuration to what we're currently doing with Green Bank, getting a 10 microsecond TOA uncertainty across several different subbands across the full S band bandwidth. We then take 30 realizations of those predicted campaigns taken several decades into the future. And at progressive steps into the future, we make measurements of the measurability of each parameter, taking the average using tempo. So from that, if we look at our measurability of delta theta, we get a GR estimated value of about 8.7 times 10 to the minus six. Uh, looking at the measurability of that parameter with these simulations, we see a three sigma significance coming in at about 3.7 years with a five sigma significance coming in at about 6.2. And that's assuming both the contributions of Green Bank and Meerkat. Take either one of those telescopes out and that time scale degrades significantly, potentially even as far as doubling in time scale. So, Hopefully we can get contributions from both those telescopes to bring that measurement uh, to fruition as soon as possible. As far as the uh, lens tiering contribution to X dot goes, given our um, estimate for the strength of that contribution as derived in the initial publication for this pulsar, uh, we expect a three sigma measurement at about 4.5 years from now. But given the caveats I've already outlined about how measurable lens tiering may be and the impacts that our lack of observed profile change might have on the misalignment angles, that measurement time scale should be taken with a very large degree of salt. So we're going to have to do some work in the future on revising that estimate and its time scale. Uh, and I'm very much out of time right now, so I'll leave you with the summary slide. Uh, thank you for your attention and time for questions. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Please, uh, question time. Uh, raise your hands if... Uh, you have uh, specific questions. Okay. Uh, Julian? Yeah, it's uh, Julian, but um, thank you. Good talk, Andrew. Um, uh, I, I was wondering on the, the point of the 
you haven't seen the pulse profile change over time, have you considered using sort of um, some alternate methods such as I think um, Greg Ashton had a sort of um, uh, uh, time domain pulse profile fitter. Um, I'm not sure whether this is loud enough to use that. Um, uh, and I'm not sure whether that's been published yet, but I do remember hearing about it on the, the Orange Pulsar Telecon a few years ago. Um, so. Uh, that's not a technique that I'm familiar with personally, although we are very much looking for alternate ways to make these measurements as per the slide that's on the screen right now. So if you've got any more information about that technique uh, that you could send my way, I'd certainly consider it as an alternate avenue. Yeah, I was just trying to search my emails for it, but uh, I'll keep looking and get back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Julian. Uh, Vivek? Uh, thanks, Andrea. Uh, nice talk, Andrew. Uh, I was just wondering uh, that since we now have about two years of of uh, Meerkat data that uh, is very easy to calibrate for polarization if you've already looked for changes in um, you know, the, the, the impact parameter in that data set? Uh, not yet. Um, to be honest, uh, my, so the, the, uh, the Meerkat data is a bit of a special case. It hasn't been properly built into the analysis just yet because there's a few different projects working on this pulsar. Uh, so I'm actually might not be the best person to ask as to the current status of the Meerkat analysis, but I do at some point want to unify that entire effort and we're still working on that right now. So I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay, thank you. Other uh, uh, questions? Are there any uh, possibility to improve the distance measurement other than those presented? Well, given that the DM, uh, so we, we expect the pulsar to be con considerably far away in distance given either of the estimates from the DM models or from the potential assumption of GR feeding back in. Uh, we have discussed potentially getting a VLBI measurement. I think it's going to be tricky. Um, I need to double check what the current status is of that. So we might get something from there. But other than that, I'm not certain of how we'd get a more accurate, accurate distance measurement to this pulsar at the moment. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, I don't see other uh, uh, reason hands, uh, but for the one of Vivek, which, okay, was the past one. All right. Uh, thanks again, Andrew, for the uh, really nice talk. And uh, uh, it's now time just for uh, Vivek to present uh, his uh, uh, contribution. Please uh, share your screen. Thanks, Andrea. I'll warn you eight minutes in advance. Sure. Before the end of the, your time. Uh, can you see my screen? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Vivek, and I'm a, a postdoctoral researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. Um, so today I will talk about uh, the relativistic binary timing program with uh, the Meerkat telescope. So I thought I'd give an introduction to Meerkat before we, we start talking about the program. Uh, we, we have heard quite a bit about Meerkat already from Andrew's talk, so I'll be quick about this. So Meerkat is this new telescope from in, in, in South Africa, so it's a, it's a radio interferometer. Uh, it has 64 13.5 meter offset Gregorian dishes, um, so that combines to form a, an equivalent of, uh, of roughly a 100 meter class telescope like Effelsberg or, or GBT. Uh, this is an SKA precursor, so this would be integrated into what would become SKA phase one, uh, also currently being built in, um, in South Africa. Um, there is already uh, plans to extend Meerkat to add uh, 20 more SKA type dishes. Um, so this is an agreement between the Max Planck Gesellschaft and uh, the South African uh, Radio Astronomy Observatory. So yeah, once this is done, um, the sensitivity of Meerkat would be improved by about 1.6 times. There are currently two receivers that are operational and we are already taking data from it. Uh, so these are the L-band receiver operating from 700 to 1650 megahertz and the UHF receiver operating from 500 to one giga, uh, megahertz to one gigahertz. Um, the uh, Yes-band receiver, as, as Andrew mentioned, so this is specifically deployed by the Max Planck Institute. Um, so the, the, the deployment uh, is, uh, is already done and uh, we already had some test observations with, um, with the 
receiver and the commissioning observations are currently happening and we, we expect that science operations would begin very soon. Um, Meerkat is an excellent instrument for, for observing pulsars and timing pulsars um, uh, for the following reasons. Uh, one is it can see the entire sky uh, that is less than 44 degrees in declination. So anything that is not uh, covered by the pink region here um, in this plot, you can, we would be able to observe those pulsars. And uh, I've, I've put a, a sample selection of pulsars from the PSRCAT uh, database um, in this diagram here. Um, I would like to uh, mention that in the in the region that is given by the teal color here, so the the only the, the most sensitive telescope that could access this region until now was the Parkes radio telescope, and now uh, Meerkat is is roughly about depending on which receivers and and uh, you compare is about five to eight times as sensitive, and so um, in this region in particular there is a tremendous increase in in, in the sensitivity of pulsar observations, and um, I should also mentioned that uh, Meerkat has a really fast uh, slew speed of about two degrees a second, which, which greatly helps in timing uh, several pulsars. And there is also the capability to split the telescope into four different chunks. These are called subarrays, and we can observe different uh, uh, pulsars independently. And uh, there is also an ability to form four uh, what are called synthesized tide array beams uh, in, within the primary beam of the telescope. So the primary beam is about a degree wide. And you can, if there are several pulsars in the, in the beam, you can time all those pulsars simultaneously. Um, so the, the pulsar timing program with Meerkat is, is uh, part of the large scale uh, project called Meertime. And so this is headed by Professor Matthew Bales from the Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, all details about this and, um, uh, and uh, the other details about the, the uh, telescope instrumentation can be found in Bales around 2020. And I recommend you to check that out. Um, so the, the timing program itself is, is split into four different themes. Uh, the first theme is the thousand pulsar array where people are, uh, are attempting to observe a thousand normal pulsars to understand uh, pulsar emission and um, scattering and, and, and the like. Uh, the second is the relativistic binary program that I will be mostly talking about in this talk. The third is the millisecond pulsar timing array, which is similar to other pulsar timing arrays with other telescopes. So this is um, uh, timing several millisecond pulsars to contribute to nanohertz gravitation wave detection. And finally, you have globular cluster timing where we are timing pulsars from globular clusters to understand the clusters themselves, but also have secondary signs uh, from those uh, pulsars. I also encourage you to check out this website, pulsars.org.au. So this contains all the, the metadata of all the observations that we have done so far. So you can check what, uh, I mean, if you have a favorite pulsar, you can go and check how it fares with Meerkat. You can get what its signal to noise is in a, in a, in a specific time. Um, you still can't get profiles uh, or, or other actual data, but uh, this is being integrated into the portal and eventually, uh, the data that is that is outside the embargo period would automatically be available from this portal. So the relativistic binary program itself um, is um, uh, its primary science goal is, as you might have guessed, um, uh, observing pulsars in in relativistic binary systems. So these are systems that host a a pulsar in uh, and a companion that could be a neutron star or a white dwarf and in the near future possibly a black hole uh, in a, in a, in a, in an orbit that is short enough or eccentric enough or has a very high inclination that you start to see relativistic effects um, so our main motive is to measure these orbital parameters and relativistic effects and combine them with other uh, pulsar properties that lead to First of all, um, precise measurements of neutron star masses and hence understand the neutron star equation of state, uh, binary evolution of how this system came to be and supernova physics. And in the longer term for, for a subsection of pulsars also perform tests of general relativity and alternative theories of gravity as, as already mentioned by previous speakers. Uh, we now have about 45 pulsars that we are currently monitoring, 39 of which are solely uh, targeted towards mass measurements. And uh, six of those pulsars, which contains the usual culprits already spoken about, so 22, 22, 17, 57, 11, 41, and, and uh, the pulsars that, uh, that were discussed earlier. Um, so these are not only for mass measurements, but also for tests of uh, theories of gravity. 
Um, we have a huge overlap uh, in the in the pulsars that we time with also the millisecond pulsar timing array. So for for the pulsars that are not overlapping, we roughly aim to have a monthly cadence um, and uh, orbital campaigns for for detections of uh, specific uh, relativistic effects such as Shapiro delay. And if the orbit is short enough, um, then we usually go for full orbit observations. And we've been doing this for the last twenty or so months. Uh, here I, I note uh, all the members that uh, that belong to the um, to the re to the uh, relativistic binary program team. So this is headed by professors Michael Kramer and 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 Ingrid Stairs, and we have several students, postdocs, and scientists working from more than seven different institutions from around the world. Uh, in early 2021, uh, we released what uh, was called a, a, a Relbin census. Um, so this uh, uh, outlined the, the science objectives and gave some early results. Uh, we presented uh, 25 of the of the currently 45 pulsars that we are timing, and uh, so you can you can scan this QR code or or go to this archive link if you want to know more about this paper. Um, in this paper, we uh, uh, reported. Diff, improved uh, dispersion measure and rotation measure uh, uh, values, and also uh, uh, reported uh, polarization calibrated full Stokes profiles from uh, for all the pulsars. And for the pulsars where we could fit for a rotating vector model for the position angle of linear polarization, we also reported that, and that was for six pulsars. And I show one of the examples for uh, for a millisecond pulsar, eighteen eleven minus twenty four oh five. In in um, yeah, in this uh, plot below, um, I also want to mention that we performed an orbital campaign uh, on this pulsar, and uh, with just an addition of fifteen more hours of data to the older um, uh, data set, we could achieve an improvement in our mass estimates uh, by about fifty percent. And you can see the the final masses that were reported in this paper, and also the corresponding mass mass diagram on the right. And there were several other um, uh, results that were also uh, published in this paper, um, including uh, results on scattering that uh, that Andrew mentioned in the previous talk. So I recommend that you check out this paper for uh, more details. Um, next, I would talk. Uh, I would like to talk about the double pulsar. So this was also already introduced by uh, uh, by Paolo, but um, just to give a very quick introduction. So this is uh, the only pulsar for which we have seen both the neutron stars visible to us as pulsars. And um, uh, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so this pulsar has this uh, system has a very high uh, inclination that. Um, um, so when you when you look at um, uh, the system, so the um, the pulses from the A pulsar is actually blocked by the the magnetosphere of the B pulsar. So the A pulsar is the mildly recycled pulsar that is twenty three milliseconds, while um, the the old the pulsar B is uh, is a older pulsar that is uh, that rotates sorry a younger pulsar that rotates at two point eight seconds. Um, so. Here is a, a cartoon that shows how this actually uh, goes. So during superior conjunction, so you have a, a tiny dot here that is the A pulsar, and the B pulsar that is in front has its magnetosphere extended. And when I when I run this animation, you could see that um, that periodically the pulses from the A pulsar is blocked by the the magnetosphere of the B pulsar, and you see the the modulation of the light curve that is exactly the same as the rotation period of the B pulsar. So due to geodetic precession, B, the B pulsar precessed away from our line of sight, so we no longer actually get radio pulses from the pulsar. But we can see that we can still infer the spin period of uh, the B pulsar by just looking at these eclipses and. Um, we reported um, the eclipses from the L band and UHF um, uh, receivers in in Kramer et al. 2021, and you can beautifully see uh, this modulation of the arrival times of uh, of the pulses that are blocked by the magnetosphere of um, of the B pulsar. Now, as I mentioned, B also under undergoes uh, geodetic precession, so the the orientation of the magnetosphere also changes as a function of time and so the the how the eclipse light curve looks 
also changes as a function of time. So you could use this information and actually infer the, the genetic precession rate of the pulsar. And this is uh, something that is done by a, a Swinburne PhD student, Marcus Lower. And uh, he, uh, with just a few observations spanning just about 18 months, gets uh, an estimate of um, uh, the genetic precession that is well inconsistent um, I mean, well, well consistent uh, with uh, the Breton et al. Uh, result from 2008, which used a lot more GPT data, uh, data spanning for about six years. Um, finally, you, you cannot just uh, infer um, the uh, spin precession, but what you can also do is to fit um, this um, um, uh, eclipse light curve with a template. So this is very similar to pulsar timing. So uh, in pulsar timing, you have a standard profile and you have data that you fit for and you get arrival times. And here you have an eclipse model and you have eclipse data and you fit for it and you can actually get an arrival time. And that an early result is shown on the right here. So this is actually timing the pulsar. Although we actually do not see the pulsar anymore, we can get time of arrivals from this pulsar. So this is a very early result. So you can see that the, the, the TOAs are, are quite coarse, but um, I, uh, uh, I recommend you to, to watch this space because um, um, we would get, um, get a lot, uh, lot more precise data once we add all the observations that we have so far. So this is still work in progress. If you want to know more about this and you are attending the, the Amaldi 14 uh, conference, so Marcus is giving a dedicated talk on just this result. And you can go and check um, uh, his talk on 21st July at 23.40 UTC. Uh, we also have obtained uh, 11 new mass measurements so far, and that is given in the in the diagram on the left. Um, so in this, uh, the teal colors represent uh, other neutron star mass measurements. Uh, the red uh, uh, points refer to uh, companions of pulsars that we are not sure if they are actually pulsar or white dwarf. And the, and the blue uh, um, uh, pulsar names here are new me new measurements from the Meerkat telescope. As you can see, we have uh, mass measurements for about 11 systems so far, and uh, we are performing orbital campaigns regularly for other systems. So this is going to improve in the near future. But this is already a 20% increase in the in the mass measurements uh, from binary pulsar systems that we know so far. And apart from this, we also have uh, inclination angle constraints for which we cannot measure the, the mass uh, quite precisely. We have inclination angle constraints, uh, so constraints on the geometry of the system for eight more, eight more systems. Um, as you can see, uh, some of these, um, the, the precision of these mass measurements are quite coarse, and this is due to two reasons. One is we only have about 18 months of data, so um, mo taking more data with Meerkat would help improve this. But um, there is also another way to improve this by adding older data sets from other telescopes. And I would show an example of uh, we doing that for, for something like 0955, which... Uh, Unfortunately, it's not here. Oh, here, it's here. Um, so this is a pulsar for which we have added the uh, older data from the Parkes Radio Telescope. And you can see that we can, we can achieve really precise masses. And this would continue for all the other pulsars that, that I've shown here. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I would like to concentrate just on this pulsar. So this is uh, uh, the same pulsar that I discussed now. This is 0955 minus 6150. Uh, this is a millisecond pulsar. This rotates uh, 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 with a spin period of about uh, 1.9 milliseconds. And uh, it is in a binary system with a helium white dwarf companion. And this was discovered by Camilla et al. 2015. On the left, you can see a full Stokes profile. Uh, so this is the, the total intensity, linear and circular polarization of the, of the pulsar. And you can see that um, the pulsar uh, profile is quite wide. And so you get several uh, points uh, uh, of position angle swing of the linear polarization that you can use to constrain its geometry that I would get, later, uh, get to it later. Um, this has an orbital period of about 24.5 days and an eccentricity of 0 0.1. And now this is a problem because the way we think millisecond pulsars form is through this phase called low mass X-ray binary phase where you have a companion that is, uh, that is evolving and now it is transferring mass onto the, the pulsar, thereby spinning it up. Now this process, this low mass X-ray binary phase 
also has a secondary uh, result of, of uh, circularizing the orbit. So if you if you look at uh, several uh, helium white dwarf uh, binaries that we know of, we always see that um, the uh, the eccentricity of them are quite tiny, and this is what is shown in this plot on the left here. So here yeah. I yes eight minutes. Uh, sure. Um, here I show um, a plot of. Um, um, orbital period as a function of orbital eccentricity. And you see that, uh, that uh, some of these pulsars stick out from the general trend. And this is called eccentric millisecond pulsars, out of which uh, 0955 is one of them. Now, there are several formation scenarios that um, uh, are proposed for eccentric uh, MSPs. And this includes uh, uh, what uh, is called the rotationally delayed accretion induced collapse. So in this case, you have a zero edge main sequence uh, companion, uh, binary, which undergoes uh, several stages of mass transfer to, uh, to form a super Chandrasekhar white dwarf along with a helium white dwarf. Now this super Chandrasekhar white dwarf is, is spinning very rapidly and but eventually gravity takes over and this white dwarf basically collapses into a neutron star. And you can, you can readily see that in this scenario, the, the, the neutron star that is formed should possess very low mass. So it can't, it can't be more than 1.4 solar masses. The other major uh, scenario that is proposed is that um, the, the formation of eccentric MSPs is exactly the same as uh, normal MSP. So it undergoes the normal uh, low mass X-ray binary phase, but post that there are thermonuclear explosions on the white dwarf surface that creates a circumbinary disk and the dynamic interaction of the binary with this disk creates the eccentricity. And uh, this is proposed by Antonio Ares et al. 2014. And they say that this happens for white dwarfs that is of 0.3 solar masses. Now there exists a relation uh, in, uh, if, a, if a binary goes through the low mass X-ray binary phase, so there exists this relation called Taurus and Savanai relation for uh, helium white dwarf companions, uh, material white dwarf binaries with uh, periods more, greater than two days, um, where they relate the, the mass of the white dwarf to the orbital period. So if the low mass X-ray binary phase is undisturbed, we expect that uh, in this um, theory, you should produce a, a mass of a white dwarf that is, that is similar similar to the mass expected from this relation. And we see that for 0955, this should be within 0.275 to 0.305 solar masses, which is, uh, which is where we also see that uh, these thermonuclear explosions happen. However, our mass measurements say, show something strikingly different. So we have observed um, two different relativistic parameters. So that is the advance of periastron and the Shapiro delay. And we get uh, masses of 1.63 and 0.247 solar masses respectively. Now the, this system now independently dispurves both of the formation scenarios that I discussed. Now, firstly, because we have a 1.63 solar mass pulsar, which is which is more massive than the 1.3 solar mass um, limit that uh, the, the accretion induced collapse re um, requires. So this, uh, this condition basically is ruled out. And so this formation scenario is ruled out. And we see that um, the, uh, the mass of the white dwarf is also very low compared to what is the prediction of Taurus in 1799. So if the LMXB phase actually was undisturbed, you should have got a, a, a more massive white dwarf. And given that our, our uh, white dwarf is not as massive, that also uh, rules out the second formation scenario that I discussed. In fact, if you want to use Taurus in 7A relation to, under, uh, to get what is the orbital period that is required for a 2.4 solar mass white dwarf, it comes to about 15, uh, sorry, 5 to 11 days, which is nowhere close to the 24 day orbit that we see. Now, currently, the, the formation scenario, uh, scenarios for e eccentric MSPs remains a mit mystery. However, we think that the position angle sweep might provide clues. Now this, I don't want to go into details because other people have covered this. So, um, so this is the rotating vector model. So um, if you fit a rotating vector model to uh, our data set, we get a value for the co-latitude co of uh, the spin axis. So this is the angle between the spin axis and our line of sight to be about 78 degrees. Now this, in by definition for spin aligned systems should be equal to the inclination angle. However, the inclination angle that we obs uh, observe from the Shapiro delay is about 83 degrees. So there is quite a discrepancy between what um, uh, we, we obtain 
in in the for the inclination angle from from two different uh, methods now there is a caveat that the rvm fits for milli, millisecond pulsars does not always work but under the caveat that it 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 works here this uh, discrepancy is indeed interesting now if the spins are actually misaligned um, then it follows a more complicated relation which involves so this is the same equation that and that andrew cameron showed um, so which involves the um, the relation between the co latitude of our uh, of the spin axis is related to the misalignment angle between the spin of the pulsar and the total angular momentum uh, and the orbital angular momentum i'm sorry uh, and so with the constraint that um, uh, that we have from the shapiro relay you can put that here and marginalize over other parameters and obtain a distribution for the misalignment angle of the system and if we do this what we do what we get is um, is that the misalignment angle moves away from zero so it is so if you believe in the ps wing for millisecond pulsars following a rotating vector model we see that the 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 spin of 0955 appears misaligned so you can see that there are two different um, uh, simulations here, i mean fits here uh, where you can see that um, uh, delta is not close to zero or to 180 degrees so this is so we have to split this into two different simulations because uh, because um, uh, of the bimodality but you can see that it is it moves away from zero degrees uh, stating that um, the the spin appears misaligned now what does this mean it could either mean that the lmxt phase never took place or the lmxt phase uh, was broken in the middle if, but if so how can you form a fully recycled neutron star that rotates at 1.9 milliseconds is a mystery and if there are several uh, if there are some other evolutionary scenarios so that needs to be investigated and i would leave this for theorists to figure this out now as a control experiment uh, we also did this with uh, another system where we know yeah, that the spin should have, be aligned you have uh, less than 2 minutes uh, yes i'm done almost uh, and we see that the posteriors are actually consistent with the spin and angular momenta so we see that the the same experiment works for for circular binaries but uh, it shows that for eccentric binaries the spin should be misaligned and i will leave with the summary here thank you thanks vivek there is just the time for one question. Uh, if, uh, if any. I don't see any answer. So maybe you, you can uh, complete uh, your prediction about these alternate models rather than uh, 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 Lomas. Uh, X-ray binary accretions for explaining this misalignment. If you uh, have ideas about that. So there is currently no other models in literature that actually predict a spin misalignment for eccentric millisecond pulsars. So um, I mean, we we should investigate this further. Thank you, Vivek. An interesting talk. And uh, it's now time for uh, one Chen. So please Hello. share yeah. your screen. I'll give you the eight minutes warning uh, when it will be the time. Can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Please okay. go ahead. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Huan Chen. I'm a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. And my, <clears throat> my talk is about constraining dense matter equation of state and testing higher order GR effects with a double pulsar. <clears throat> so um, Michael and Paulo had, uh, and Vivek has given uh, some introductions to the double pulsar already. So I will just uh, quickly go through it. Um, so the double pulsar is named uh, GO737 minus 3039. Uh, it's the only uh, system where both neutron stars have been uh, discovered as pulsars. And it's one of the most relativistic binary pulsar system, uh, which have a compact orbit um, than the sun. And it has provided some of the most precise uh, strong field tests of GR. And there are a lot of new uh, results in the Kramer et al. Uh, uh, upcoming paper. 
So for such a relativistic uh, binary orbits, uh, we uh, the Kaplan parameters are not uh, enough to describe the motion, and we uh, need to have the post Kaplan parameters. So for the double pulsar, uh, the periodic advance is about 70, 17 degree per year, which is quite significant. And also we measure the orbital period decay due to the gravitational wave emission. Uh, this measurement shows that uh, the double pulsar will merge in 85 million year. And it is the most accurate test for the gravitational quadruple emission predicted by GR. Uh, which is uh, 1.3 times 10 to the minus 4 with 95% confidence. Uh, we also measure the range and shape of Shapiro delay as well as the uh, Einstein delay. And all these post kaplan parameters are theory independent. So for every theory, they can uh, be written as a function of Kaplan parameters and the masses of the two pulsars. Therefore, from this measurement, we can um, measure the mass of the pulsars and do GR test. So here is a mass mass diagram showing all the measurable uh, post cavern parameters for the double pulsar. And they all uh, meet at uh, meet together, which uh, agrees very well with GR. And these uh, seven parameters provide five independent GR tests. And also, Michael has shown on Monday that there's an emerging one, which is the relativistic orbital deformation. So the mass measurement is very important because this can be used to constrain the equation of state of the neutron stars. So here uh, in this figure, it shows the mass radius relation of a number of uh, equation of states. And the um, orange and blue uh, horizontal lines here indicates the one sigma uncertainty from the two heaviest pulsars. So by combining these two results, we got a lower limit of the maximum neutron mass, which is uh, greater than 1.98 solar masses at 99% confidence level. So for the equation of state that cannot support such masses are being excluded. To further constrain the equation of state, uh, this can be done via relativistic spin orbital coupling um, where in the relativistic binaries, the spin of a rotating body couples with the uh, orbital angular momentum. And this is also named as uh, lens theorem precession. <laughs> so for the double pulsar, uh, Fultman et al. shown that the spin of pulsar A is practically aligned with the uh, orbital uh, angular momentum. And this is this makes it possible to measure the lens theorem precession via the uh, it's changed to the longitude of pure astron. So for the uh, omic dot, we consider the first and second post plus the lens tearing contribution, where the lens tearing uh, contribution depends on the moment of inertia, um, which uh, also depends on the equation of states. Hence, the measurement of the moment of inertia will allow us to constrain the equation of state. So here in this table, we show the magnitude from uh, each contribution. And this symbol here is close to unity and depends on the equation of state. So the lens tearing contribution from pulsar A uh, is very close in magnitude to the second post-Newtonian, but with uh, opposite sign. From the observation, we can only measure the uh, com uh, combination of all these contributions. And our uh, observing uh, precision is now about 40 times smaller than the lens theorem contribution. So we do have a good precision um, for omic dot. However, to uh, extract the lens theorem contribution, we need two other best measured post cavern parameters to pa measure the masses of the two pulsars. And we are limited by the precision of PP dot, the change of the orbital period. So our observed value contains the intrinsic contribution and the external effect from galactic acceleration and Shklovsky effect. So the observing precision will be improved with time and especially with new telescopes such as Meerkat and SKA. 
for the intrinsic contributions, uh, of course, the uh, main contribution is the leading order gravitational wave damping. And for the first time, we also need to consider the mass loss in the rotational energy, which uh, by itself depends on the, sorry, on the moment of inertia of the pulsar. So in the table here, I show the magnitude from each contribution. Although the contribution from mass loss is still below the observing uncertainty, uh, we have to account for this in the an analysis. Otherwise, this will lead to a bias to the moment of inertia measurement. Also, the, the observing precision is uh, improving rapidly with time. So for the external effect, these two contributions uh, depends on our knowledge of the distance of the pulsar and also the galactic gravitational potential. And soon uh, we will be limited by this uh, measurement. So this uh, needs need to be improved in parallel. So with these three uh, post parameters, we can solve them uh, simultaneously to derive the mass of the two pulsars and the moment of inertia. So Michael has shown on Monday that with 16 year data, they were able to get a detection of the moment of inertia, uh, which is below uh, three uh, at 90% confidence. Uh, this is still not uh, good enough compared with other method. So more data will be needed to get a robust result and the increase in the sensitivity of the telescope will be important. And that's where the meerkat comes in. So uh, Vivek has uh, gave an in introduction about meerkat and we start observing uh, the double pulsar with meerkat since 2019. And we are now getting about two years of data set. And in previously the best data set were coming from the Green Bank Telescope and meerkat is uh, close to the GBT in the size of the effective uh, diameter. However, because the location of the double pulsar, the precision we get from Meerkat is about 2.5 times better than the GBT. So this comparison is made at L band. So in, uh, indeed, Meerkat and SK is the best telescope for observing the double pulsar uh, to understand the capacity of uh, measuring the moment of inertia in the near future, we perform a simulation um, assuming the observation from Meerkat, Meerkat Plus and SK1. So this was the estimate uh, when we wrote the paper, but this could be changed. And for the um, uncertainty in the Meerkat Plus and SK1, we just scale it based on the Meerkat and with the size of the telescope. So in the simulation, we assume two orbits per month at L band. This is this was done before we have the UHF data available. In reality, we have one orbit per month at L band or UHF band, where UHF is 50% better than L band. Plus, we also got other telescopes. So this is equivalent to uh, to the simulation setup. So before I show the simulation result, here are the pre preliminary result with the timing data. Um, here, this table shows the post current parameter uh, of the 16 year data and the two year meerkat data. And uh, we don't get a good uh, measurement for the long-term um, parameter PB dot yet, but for all the other parameters, they are in good agreement with the 16 year data, uh, especially the Shapiro parameters, they are even slightly better. So these are the traditional, uh, the shape and range of the Shapiro delay. And Michael has shown on Monday that uh, for the first time, they uh, also measure the next two leading order contributions of the, in the Shapiro delay and the aberration. And this is the residual of this uh, signature so in GR, the, this factor should be equal to one. Uh, we are still uh, working on a delicate analysis of the Meerkat data and trying to combine it with the 16 year data. So um, it's very uh, promising that we will, uh, the combined data set will be, uh, will improve the 
measurement of the nesting, next to leading order contributions and also the relativistic orbital deformation. So here is a prediction of the post cavern parameter and distance from the simulation. And here I show the, the left, uh, I show in the left panel the fractional error of the five post cavern parameters and they decrease rapidly uh, with the new telescopes come seen. And on the right side is uh, uncertainty of the distance uh, derived from the timing parallax. And we are now at a stage that the timing, the uncertainty from the timing parallax will uh, go smaller than the VLBI measurement. So with these post covering parameters, we can um, um, measure the moment of inertia. And this figure shows the uncertainty of the moment of inertia that we uh, we can get in the future. So the blue line, we adopt the uh, galactic measurement from gravity collaboration 2019. <clears throat> and this gives 25% uh, uh, uncertainty by 2030. Of course, our knowledge of the galactic gravitational potential will certainly be improved in the next 10 years. And if the errors are negligible um, compared to the observing uncertainty, then we expect to see a 11% um, precision by 2030. So what can we do with this 11% uh, measurement? So the, in this plot, we show the, a number of equation of state that can support a neutron star with uh, 1.98 solar masses. And the red bar here indicates the 11% uh, uncertainty. So to compare with other method, the gray dashed lines are uh, equation of state that excluded by the double neutron star merger event. And the blue dashed lines are further excluded by this GW event with the nuclear theory. The remaining um, blue solid lines are quite close to our 11% prediction. So in the future, um, there will be more, we expect to see more and more uh, double neutron star merger event detected by LIGO and Virgo. Uh, also, we have the nicer uh, measurement ongoing. So they are probably will provide better constraint on the equation state in the near future. Well, if the equation state um, can be well measured, we can then in turn to test the lens theorem precession. So in the general uh, class of theories, one can describe the spin orbital coupling with a Lagrangian, where gamma is a coupling functions depending on the gravity theory. So in this framework, we can write the general form of the lens Turing contribution to the pure astron advance. And the sigma A here is a coupling constant, and this parameter is theory independent. So we define a parameter delta LT to measure the deviation of this parameter from GR's prediction. And then we can use a three post covering parameter to solve for delta LT. And here we again show uh, in two cases, the blue line is uh, using this, the current uh, galaxy model and assume a moment of inertia with 5% error then we uh, expect 18% uh, 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 precision by 2030. Uh, if the errors in the getting model and distance and moment of inertia can be ne neglected uh, compared to the observing uncertainty, then we can expect a 7% measurement by 2030. And this will be a complementary test to the geodetic precision test by Brunton et al. 2008, where they measured uh, the coupling constant uh, of the pulsar B, and it agrees with GR with 13% um, precision. So another test we can make if we know the equation of state well, uh, very well is the next to leading order gravitational wave damping. Uh, Blanchett and Schaeffer in 1989 extend the GW damping to the 3.5 post Newtonian order, and this is the full uh, equation. So we can write this in a simplified form like this, where x uh, 3.5 post Newtonian is the um, 
is a next to linear order term. So again, we can solve for this term using the three uh, post capron parameters. And this is this figure shows the prediction of the uncertainty of this measurement. And in the most optimistic case, we expect to see a three sigma detection by 2030. So the uh, the black dash line here indicate the, the value of x of uh, 3.5 post 20. So as you see that in SK1, the uncertainty of this parameter uh, is going below its theoretical value. So that means that we need to, uh, for the first time, consider this um, contribution in our analysis uh, from SK1. So the last thing I want to talk about is the potential new discovery of the double neutron star system. Yes, Chen, uh, you have still eight minutes, uh, including. Okay. Five. Yeah. So a recent uh, study by Pasilio et al. Uh, 2021 showed that LIGO Virgo sensitivities are limited to relatively stiff equation of state. So they simulate like 20. Uh, double neutron star merger event, and they found that if uh, the if the equation state is solved, then with 20 uh, detections, it will not be enough to distinguish the solved equation state, and the third generation detectors will be needed. And this means that the constraining equation of state um, via pulsar timing is still in the game. So we now have a number of large surveys with Meerkat, FAST, and eventually with SK. So we have like TRAPOM, CRAFTS, GPPS, and they all have uh, discovered a lot of new pulsars within just a few years of operation, and the number is still increasing. So we hope to discover a double neutron star system that are more relativistic than the double pulsar. And here is an uh, example, uh, J1946 plus 2052. It has an orbital period of 1.9 hour, which is like the double pulsar in 40 million year. Therefore, we are confident that there will be more cousins of the double pulsar to be discovered. And if uh, we can find one with an orbital period of 50 minutes, uh, which uh, is within the capacity of Meerkat and fast, then with 10 years of timing, we can get a moment of inertial measurement of 1% uh, precision. And this will uh, lead to a quite competitive constraint on the equation of state. Yeah, and here is the summary um, of, from the simulation based on the, the real realistic uh, observation uh, uncertainties we predict that by 2030, we can get a momentary inertia measurement of 11% precision for the double pulsar, and this will be complementary to other methods. And if by 2030, the equation of state is known sufficiently via other method, then this will allow a 7% test of the lens theorem precession and three sigma measurement of the next two leading order gravitational wave damping. Of course, the knowledge of the gaptic gravitational potential need to be improved in parallel. And discovery of uh, relativity double neutron star system will allow an even better uh, moment, moment of inertia precision within uh, 10 years. So the timing of uh, the double pulsar with Meerkat uh, is still ongoing and more results to come uh, in the future. So I hope that I can share more results uh, next time with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Wan Chen. Nice, really nice talk. Time for uh, questions. Uh, I don't see for the moment uh, hands uh, up, so I, I I'll go with the uh, with, with the personal one. Um, um, uh, are uh, polarization measurement uh, useful somehow to? To improve something of this uh, uh, timing, or uh, um, or it's difficult 
to use them in the context of timing the double pass. Uh, well, for the UHI band, we still don't have the polarization calibration yet. So I can't tell about that. Uh, for our band, we we didn't do a comparison because the data was uh, automatically uh, calibrated from the pipeline. But yeah, I think it might help. Uh, it might help uh, slightly. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, other questions? So your, uh, uh, I have another myself. Um, um, you mentioned the the possibility of uh, <clears throat> uh, going much better in constrain uh, um, uh, the moment of inertia in case you find a, a, a fifty minute uh, orbit uh, double neutron star system. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, is uh, this uh, uh, um, a, a strong limit, or if you if you should have a, a neutron star black hole system, you could do better for the neutron star, provided that the neutron star is a millisecond spinning object. Uh, well, this simulation was. Um... Yeah, actually this depends on a lot of things. And for this simulation, we just assume that the distance of the pulsar uh, is at the place of the double pulsar uh, it, there. And also the, actually we adopt every um, parameters from the double pulsar, but just evolve it to the future with uh, this orbital period. But this, um, but this will certainly depends on the like the brightness of the pulsar, the distance, and uh, all other um, all other things. So this is just a very rough estimate if if the that system has a similar setup with the double pulsar. Uh, I don't know how this uh, compared to the pulsar black hole system. <laughs> um, I, I probably. Pulsar black hole will, will give a even stronger constraint. Thank you, Wenchen. Uh, thanks again for your uh, extremely interesting talk. Uh, the, the next talk is uh, now uh, focusing on globular cluster pulsars uh, given by uh, Federico Abate. Please, Federico, you can share the screen. Thank you. And here is the presentation. OK, so I can start. Um, in this presentation, I would like to talk about some results of the projects and the results of searching for pulsars in globular cluster with the Meerkat telescope as a collaboration between the Mir time working group and the TRAPUM working group. So first of all, why do we want to look for pulsars in globular clusters? So, okay. So globular clusters, here are two famous globular clusters, Omega Sen and 47 TAC. Uh, they are interesting because they are, they, have, they are very massive. They typically have very old stars with no signs of recent star formation. And a very interesting property is that they have very high stellar density in the core, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses per parsec cube, which is about three or four orders of magnitude higher than in the galactic disk. The real reason we want to look for more pulsars in globular clusters is that we know that there are a lot of them, and most of them are millisecond pulsars. We know that there are, uh, from, from what we know right now, there are about 100 times more pulsars per unit of stellar mass in globular clusters than in the galactic disks. So we want to target these objects though, because we know that we will find more, more objects. So why are there so many pulsars in globular clusters? 
The reason has to do with the very high stellar density, much higher than in the galactic disk. And this stellar density implies that there will be higher chances of encounters between stars, um, more importantly, between binary systems and, and other systems, triple encounters. And if this happens, for example, we have an example here, if we have an isolated neutron star that goes close to a binary system, the, in, the system can evolve into uh, the, the, bin the pulsar can, well, at this point is still a neutron star, can get into the binary system, expelling one of the companions, forming a new, becoming part of a, of a binary system. And when this happens, uh, the pulsar can accrete matter from the companion and become, uh, become recycled into a millisecond pulsar. Once it becomes recycled as a millisecond pulsar, it can live on for longer than a Hubble time. So as soon as uh, one uh, recycling event happens for the, in, in the entire life of the globular cluster, we will see the, this, the, the, the pulsar will be active. So we, if the beam is pointing towards us, we will be, we will be able to see it. So uh, this uh, strange scenario in which the, the pulsars are formed through this very chaotic environment uh, creates a very wide range of unusual, unexpected, and exotic systems. Like for example, so the most common one is isolated MSPs, which are quite rare in the galaxy, but are very common in the in globular clusters because the millisecond pulsars after the recycling scenario, the binary can be disrupted and the millisecond pulsar can, be, can become isolated again. Another type of systems is systems with low mass main sequence companions like black widows and redbacks. These are very interesting because they, they sometimes show eclipses when the main sequence star covers and eclipses the, the Newton star. And these are very useful to stack the properties of the companion star and the accretion process itself. Other systems are systems with very high eccentricity. As we just heard from Vivek, Creating systems, binary systems uh, with millisecond pulsars with very high eccentricity is very hard in the galaxy, but it is become, becomes much easier in the in a globular cluster because of these um, of, of this very high number of encounters that can either exchange uh, exchange uh, companions or just increase the eccentricity through repetitive encounters. And this is very important because uh, systems with high eccentricity allow uh, some, uh, make some post Keplerian parameters easy to measure, for in particular the rate of advance of periaston, because if the system is very eccentric, we can measure the, we can measure the periaston more precisely and we can measure its, its rate of advance more precisely, which allows us to measure the masses of the, of the system. And, uh, um, and so we can look for Newton stars with masses with high masses. We have evidence in globular clusters that there are some pulsars with very high masses, possibly even with more than two solar masses, but we do not have very precise masses of these uh, precise measures of these masses. But if there are pulsars with this with such masses, we can test the mass limit and the equation of state of Newton stars and push, the, push this limit much higher. And we, we have just seen how important it is to, to know precisely the equation of state of Newton stars. Other systems that can form, but we haven't seen anything, we haven't seen yet, are possibly millisecond pulsar, millisecond pulsar binaries, or even, uh, we have heard that it's a dream of all pulsar astronomers, millisecond pulsar black hole binaries. And, if millisecond pulsars and black holes are present in globular clusters, there is a chance that uh, an encounter that, that we, can, we can create binaries such as this. Uh, what other types of pulsars do we have? Well, since, global, since uh, neutron stars can go through multiple stages of recycling, uh, we can have very fast pulsars. The fastest millisecond pulsar is known is, is in a globular cluster, but we can also uh, have but these interactions can also interrupt the recycling before it's completed. We can have uh, some mildly recycled pulsars. Other, but 
Actually, we also see some very slow pulsars, pulsars with period above 100 milliseconds. The slowest one we know is even about one second period. So uh, this is a very, this is a big mystery because normally when we see a, peer, a pulsar with this period, we would assume that it's a young pulsar recently formed, but in globular cluster, we know that there is no recent star formation. So pulsars cannot be formed recently through normal stellar evolution scenarios. So one hypothesis that has been put forward is that these pulsars come from the collapse of massive white dwarfs, possibly through a accretion-induced collapse or merger-induced collapse. But we know very few pulsars with this period, and we know very few about them, but very, very little about them. So we want to know more and find, find more of these pulsars to study them better, because forming another scenario, another uh, giving evidence of another formation scenario for, for pulsars, for neutron stars, would be very exciting. So uh, what other types of science can we do in global classes? So right now, we've, I've only talked about individual pulsars and how they can be interesting in, in solving some scientific problems that we have. But if we consider the entire population and look at the, all of the globular all of the pulsars in a single globular clusters, what can we do? Well, we can measure the ionized gas to the dispersion measure. We can measure the internal magnetic field of the globular cluster with the rotation measure of the pulsars. We can also measure the gravitational potential as it influences the acceleration of the pulsar, which is accessible through us uh, through the um, period derivative. And once we have the gravitation, once we know something about the gravitational potential of the cluster, we can look for intermediate mass black holes. Do we see a mass excess in the center of, of this cluster that is unexplained by other luminous, luminous matter? Is this mass excess compatible with an intermediate mass black hole? Could this be um, a system of, uh, of white dwarfs in the center, a system of binary black holes in the center? We, we, these are all possibilities. And these are all very interesting things that we can do with pulsars in globular clusters. So, uh, what, what, where are we now? Well, where were we in a couple of years ago? We knew about 150 pulsars, and we, we saw, we see most of them were, were in a, just in a couple of, in a couple of clusters. And if we look at the discovery rate per year, we see that most of the discoveries were bunched together uh, in, in, in some years following the, either the, the, the dis first discoveries of the pulsars, or in globular clusters, or the upgrades and constructions of new facilities that allowed for a greater improving sensitivity to study these, uh, these, these clusters. But we see that in the last 10 years, in the, after 2008, we reached a sensitivity limit in which new observations of the, uh, with the existing telescope did not provide new pulsars. However, from 2018, uh, we have two new telescopes that have come online and that can greatly outcompete their competitors in their in the respective latitude ranges. One of them is Meerkat in uh, South Africa, the other one is FAST in uh, China. Uh, right now, I will only talk about Meerkat because this is the project. And so, um, so what we can, we, can, we can predict, we could predict before that is, is that we, the condition were right for a new burst of discoveries. Now let's see if this is, this is true. Uh, I will only talk about Meerkat, which we have already, have a, already had a great introduction in the previous talks uh, about Meerkat. And there are two main projects in Meerkat, uh, using Meerkat, looking at pulsars, mere time, uh, uh, which focus on timing and Trapum, which focus on searching. Mere time has been already introduced by, by Vivek. And uh, um, both, of these, uh, um, both of these projects have a wide range of targets, have a wide range of priorities in their respective field. But both of them, uh, for both of them, globular classes have a very high priority. And since we are looking at the same targets with the same telescope, uh, the two groups decided to work in synergy 
to uh, work complementary and, um, and work together. Why does this work very well for these two projects? Well, it is because of the observing setup. So let's look at first an, a typical observation of a global cluster with near time. Well, we would use uh, only one beam that covers the, only the core of the cluster. And since we want this beam to be as large as possible, we want to use only the antennas of the core so that the baseline, maximum baseline is smaller. This means that we can only use up to 40 antennas, which means we have a lower sensitivity, but we can use, we can get full stokes data, we can get coherent dispersion, we can get high time resolution. So this is good for timing, uh, for, for precise timing, for polarization studies, but it is not so good for looking for new pulsars. On the other hand, TRAPUM has a different strategy. It uses much smaller beams created with uh, the entire array, so using all, all the antennas available with up to 764 antennas, but creates not just one beam, but 280 beam, well, the number can change, but usually use 280 beams covering the, entire, the, the entirety of the cluster, at least most of the cluster. And each beam has maximum sensitivity. So each beam is, uh, is very, is very, has a very high sensitivity. However, since the data rate would be uh, two, is, two, is very great, uh, we cannot save polarization, we cannot use uh, coherent dispersion, and we have to re reduce the time resolution to a lower value. And even with this, the data the raw data volume is, is immense, it's 55 terabytes per hour, so we need to reduce it as, as fast as possible, and we cannot save the raw data. Uh, and even the, the, the reduced data takes a lot of space and we need to analyze it very fast and there's a lot of data to analyze. Uh, so in this way, we can see that the mere time and TRAPUM work, uh, um, work very well together with mere time focusing on specific pulsars, focusing on polarization and focusing on high time, high time resolution timing while TRAPUM focusing on searching the entire cluster. So what, 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 let, let's go now to the, to the results. We already wasted a lot of time talking about the first part. Let's go to the interesting thing about the results. So the first census was done with just near time and we found eight new uh, millisecond pulsars. They are all very, very interesting. We see two new pulsars in 47 TAC, both eclipsing, uh, both eclipsing pulsars. We see that there are three, three isolated pulsars, and we also see that there are two pulsars that are binary and that are, that are written as massive, that we have indication that the neutron star is very massive. One of them, and the most, and the most uh, interesting one of the set, is NGC 6624G, which we see as a very eccentric orbit. It is one of the eccentric pulsars that we, that we talked in the introduction. Uh, we see here the, the plot of the spin period as a function of the date. So in a circular orbit, you would expect a sinusoidal, but he, what, we see, what we see here is very much non-sinusoidal, the, the eccentricity is very high. Because of this high eccentricity, it becomes possible to measure precisely the rate of advance of periaston, even with, with a not long data span. And once we have the rate of advance of periaston, if we use regular general relativity, we can measure the total mass of the system, and we get a total mass of the system of about 2.65 solar masses. But still, we do not know the, the mass of the, the, of the single components, but what we can do, we can create probability maps. Here we see the companion mass as a function of the inclination angle and, the and as a function of the pulsar mass with the constraints given by the uh, advanced rate of advance of periaston. We see that the error bars are very big, but if we look at the pulsar mass, we see that it peaks at about, at more than two solar masses, about 2.10 solar masses, but it has a very long tail at low masses. So we cannot say it, it is, looks like a very massive pulsar, but we cannot say it as yet, as, as of now, because we cannot exclude all of this very wide range of probability. 
What we can say, however, is that the probability that this pulsar is more than has a mass higher than two solar masses is about 70%, which means it's a, it's a very uh, high priority target to keep studying and looking for more uh, post triplarian parameters in order to pinpoint exactly the mass and possibly push the limit of the, of the, of the maximum mass of Newton stars even higher. We can, we certainly hope so, but for now it is still not possible. So uh, this, these first results were already, are already published. You can look at them online on this monthly notices paper by Ridolfi et al. And, eight, eight minutes. Okay, yeah, thanks. And now let's look at the total discoveries by Mia Time and Trafum together. So right now we have 34 new discoveries. And here is the list of all of the new discoveries made by, by Mia Time and Trafum. You can see an up-to-date count at the, the Trafum website. So instead of going through the list and looking at uh, going through the, these tables, I want to focus on some interesting pulsars. So for example, uh, the cluster NGC 1851 is, uh, was not very particular before, before we looked at it. it we only knew one known pulsar in this cluster. But by after looking only, after searching only the central parts of the, of the cluster with Trapum, we have already discovered 13 new pulsars. So this immediately jump put, puts this cluster as one of the richest one in uh, as for number of pulsars. Let's look instead of um, at some exciting binaries that we, that we find. Well, one of these pulsars in, in this cluster exactly is, uh, looks, looks to be extremely eccentric. We, we saw before the eccentricity, the, the, the same plot for the, um, for the NGC 6624G, and we saw that it was already very eccentric. This put is, 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 ex, is extreme. The eccentricity is 0 0.71, but however, we, we do not have enough data points to exactly uh, pinpoint the, the, the full orbit. We see, we see that all of the data points we have are only on this uh, this uh, side that is going up, we do not have any points on the other side. So we need more orbital coverage to uh, exactly pinpoint the average. But from what we can say right now, uh, uh, we can say that this, this pulsar, this massive, the companion of this pulsar is very massive. If we assume that the pulsar has a mass of 1.4 solar masses, then the companion has to be at least 1.5 solar masses. So this has, this, is, this has the potential of being a very interesting pulsar. Uh, once we get more information on the orbit and possibly even some post keplerian parameters to measure the masses more precisely. On the other side, the, the, on the other hand, we also have found a very low mass companion in NGC 6440. Uh, uh, this companion, this pulsar using this, the same assumption of a pulsar mass of 1.4 solar masses, we get that the companion has to be more massive than 0.006 solar masses. This is only a lower limit, it could be higher, but it is much below, very well below the, the hydrogen burning limit. And we can assume that it could probably be a brown dwarf or, or even a massive planet. There is only one known mass, one known planet orbiting uh, a pulsar in, um, in a globular cluster. So even adding just one would be very interesting to learning how these systems can form, and how this system can, can stay stable in these uh, very chaotic environments. Uh, other interesting pulsars that I want to, to highlight, we found two new uh, mildly recycled pulsars about 20 to 30 milliseconds. But we also found a, a slow pulsar uh, in NGC 6441 at 250 millisecond pulsar. We see this is very bright. Uh, this is very interesting because, uh, because as I said, uh, we know very few pulsars of this, uh, of this type, of this, of this type of very slow pulsars in globular clusters. And knowing more can help us uh, find out their, their nature. 
find out how they are formed and how they evolve. Okay, so these are the, the, the main results. What are the plans for the, for the future? Well, on the problem side, we want to keep looking at these clusters and keep analyzing the data. These, these results that we've shown are not uh, fully, uh, full data was not already not analyzed. Only parts of the data, the only parts of the data were analyzed. So my, many more discoveries may lie in the already observed uh, data that we have. But we want to keep going and observe other clusters, some of, some of which uh, without already known pulsars, so that we can increase the, the, the number of pulsars and the, the range of global clusters with pulsars even more. On the near time side, uh, we, we want to look at these pulsars to measure the, the masses of, of binary pulsars want to characterize the eclipses. We want to study the properties of the clusters, like the gas content, magnetic field, and possibly look for uh, intermediate mass black holes and other projects. Uh, OK, so let, let's give a summary. Uh, in 2018, we knew about 150 pulsars in, uh, in clusters. Now, three years later, uh, we know about 230 pulsars, so already an increase of 80 pulsars in about three years. Uh, as I said, 34 of these come from Meerkat, but we see that there are many other uh, discoveries un unaccounted by Meerkat, and many of them come by FAST. As I said, FAST was uh, was uh, a very important competitor to Meerkat as a number of global cluster pulsar discoveries, and it will be in the, also in the future, it will be, it will be in the future very important in, the, in this context. But also, uh, is, we do not have to uh, imagine that pulsar discovery that global cluster science is only relegated to these new facilities. Also, GBT, PAX, and GMRT have discovered new pulsars, and also very interesting pulsars by themselves. So um, this was the this was the talk. Um, remember to stay tuned and look at the Trapo and Mia Time website for updates on the discoveries. Publications on all of these discoveries are coming in the in the following months. So we hope to find even more exciting pulsars in the in the new observations and in analyzing the previous observations. And this is all. So thanks. Thank you, Federico. We have just time for one single question. <clears throat> I don't see any. And uh, I have one then. Uh, uh, in your opinion, which, which are the most promising clusters for uh, for investigating the presence of uh, intermediate mass black holes? Well, intermediate mass black holes are, uh, um, let's look at uh, the list here. Um, it, it's quite tricky to, to look for intermediate mass black holes. We, what we need is, pulse, is clusters with a very large number of pulsars in the close to the center. So probably the new, the newly discovered pulsars in one NGC 1851 would be interesting, at least if not to find the uh, intermediate mass black hole to put stringent limits on the mass excess in the center. Otherwise, other other pulsar, other clusters let me find it. Uh, we have uh, M62, which is very promising, which has shown some interesting trends with only the the previous. Uh, Pulsar known. We also have uh, other, well, 47 TAC is, al is always a, a prime target for this kind of studies. And maybe NGC 6624, which is uh, also had some interesting history regarding pulsars and intermediate mass black holes. These are the main targets. Thank you, Federico. A great talk. And uh, uh, 
Uh, it's now time for uh, Michele Majorano, uh, who can share the Yes, I'm, sh the I'm sharing the screen. Um, OK. He will talk about uh, inclusion of global cluster uh, millisecond pulsars in, in uh, pulsar timing arrays. Mm, just a second. OK. Do you see in my full screen? Sure. Okay. Do you see the pointer? Okay. Yes. Although it's black on black. But... <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, today um, I am Michele Majorano. Uh, I'm a PhD student from uh, University of Salento. And my presentation is about the advantages of the inclusion of global cluster millisecond pulsars in pulsar timing arrays. So let me first uh, briefly introduce the, um, wh what are the pulsar timing arrays. A pulsar timing array is uh, simple, a set of millisecond pulsars that are constantly monitored uh, from the earth. Uh, wh what we, can, uh, we, we want to, to see, um, uh, we, we want to see the difference uh, between the time of our, uh, arrival of each uh, pulse emitted by uh, these millisecond pulsars that are uh, the most stable uh, pulsars uh, that we can observe. Uh, and we want to see um, uh, some difference between the observation and uh, the, what we can uh, predict uh, with uh, a timing model. Uh, because uh, if the timing model uh, describes uh, well uh, what we observe, uh, uh, simply we have no timing residual uh, that are uh, the difference between the, of the prediction and the, uh, the observations. Uh, while we, uh, if uh, there are some uh, structures in uh, timing residuals, uh, we can say that uh, there are some uh, effects that uh, are not included in the timing model. Uh, one of these effects can be uh, the presence of a gravitational wave, because a gravitational wave can stretch or compress the distance between the Earth and uh, millisecond pulsars, uh, and this uh, will cause a delay or an advance in the pulse time of arrival. Uh, so uh, this uh, make possible to use the pulsar timing arrays data uh, to detect uh, gravitational waves uh, because uh, the timing residuals associated with the gravitational wave uh, has um, uh, an exact uh, shape that depends that of, uh, on the type of the gravitational wave source that we are observing. Uh, currently, pulsar timing arrays are sensitive uh, to gravitational waves uh, with a period in the range from some weeks to some years and uh, with a strain amplitude that uh, uh, is greater uh, to 10 raised to minus 16. Uh, so this means that uh, essentially we are sensitive to supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, that uh, are expected to be the loudest gravitational wave source that can be observed by pulsar timing arrays. Uh, so um, the theory is, is uh, uh, sh pretty short. Uh, we have a, a function uh, that describes the, um, the timing residual that are induced by a gravitational wave, in this case, we consider a, continu a continuous gravitational waves, a wave uh, emitted by a supermassive black hole binary. And uh, oh, oh, um, it is important just to say uh, that uh, this quantity depends on two, factor, uh, two factors. One is a geometrical factor, and it is called the antenna pattern function, and uh, it is plotted in this picture on the left. And uh, the other factor is due to the uh, space-time metric, uh, essentially at, uh, calculated at the position of the solar uh, system barycenter, that is called uh, for, for legacy Earth term, and uh, uh, the position of uh, pulsar, that is called uh, pulsar term. So in, in, a, in the case of continuous gravitational wave, 
uh, the strain the strain of the a asymm polarization is uh, simply a sinusoid. Uh, this formula, however, is uh, general, uh, so it is true also for other kind of sources, like, uh, for example, the bus. Uh, Michele? Michele, I cannot hear you anymore. I'm just me or uh, everyone is not hearing uh, Michele? No, I've lost him too. Uh -huh. Video feed seems to be frozen. Yeah. Okay, Michele, I can see you, you again. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. So, mm, I had uh, some problems of connection. Sorry. No worry, no worry. Please go ahead. Uh, Restart from where you from where you were. <laughs> okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. I hope uh, that you hear me now. Yeah, yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I was saying that um, an ensemble of supermassive black hole, uh, black hole binaries produce, uh, produces a gravitational wave background that uh, can be simply obtained by integrating on all direction and all the emitted frequencies, the timing residuals that I, I have showed, uh, shown in the, in the previous slide. And this is characterized by a characteristic strain spectrum that says uh, essentially that uh, we are sensitive uh, to, to low frequency gravitational waves. Uh, the, the main problem. Michele. There are still troubles with your connection, I think. Can wait one minute. Maybe. Switching off the camera could help. Looks like he's disconnected properly now. Yeah. Just wait one minute or two, otherwise, uh, Julian, stay prepared to. To, re to go ahead and then we we may come back to to Michele later <clears throat> no signals yet from uh, Michele. So uh, I think, uh, Julian, you, you are ready in case to. Yep, I can go now. And we can go back to Michele if he comes back. Yes, I think it's better for you to go on now, and then we will we will have Michele talk later. Yeah, maybe keep the time even. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Can you see uh, that? Yes, I write to to Michele a propose that. Yeah, 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 you can go ahead. Meanwhile, uh, Julian. 
Okay, cool. Uh, thank you, um, Andrea. Um, a little bit odd sort of jumping in the middle, but I guess we've got to keep these sessions to time. Um, so hello everyone, I'm uh, Julian um, Carlin. I'm a PhD student um, at, at Melbourne Uni working with Andrew Milatos. Um, let's do something in the chat, okay. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna to talk about Pulsar glitches and hopefully answer this question that I've got as my sort of title slightly provocatively. Um, you know, asking the question, are pulsar glitches caused by a, by a stress release process? Um, turn on my video. Uh, hopefully my connection is good enough and doesn't disconnect. Um, so hopefully by the end of the talk, I can, I can make some ways towards answering this question. Um, uh, uh, and, and I guess that's the real focus of this talk is emphasizing that we can start answering this question. We can make falsifiable statements and predictions and look at data and see whether our theory matches the data. So just a quick little introduction. You know, we've heard a lot about pulsars so far in the session, um, but, but not so much about pulsar glitches yet. And so pulsar glitches are, are these events um, that interrupt the otherwise um, secular spin down of, of a pulsar. You know, we usually see um, young pulsars or, or pulsars in general spin down um, steadily over time, um, over time scales of years. And in some pulsars, we see occasional um, spin up events. Uh, these spin up events are small, um, you know, usually of order one part in a million um, in sort of fractional size, um, and, and they happen very quickly. The, the time scale of, of the, the rise time um, is, is unresolved as of yet. Um, you know, the, the tightest constraints are of order sort of 10 seconds, um, but, but we haven't actually seen that rise. And so we you know, can consider them as sort of impulsive events, which have some size. Then after the glitch, there's, there's often a sort of relaxation um, where, where the spin frequency sort of um, exponentially decays back to either the, the spin down that I had previously or sometimes to a, to a you know, slightly larger spin down right? Um, and then not all pulsars do this, obviously, and, and it's, it's a rare event. You know, the, these glitches in pulsars that do glitch are often separated by years. Um, and so of, of 40 years of timing various pulsars, and especially young pulsars, seem to glitch the most. Um, there's been a total of about 550 glitches in, in total that have been observed. Um, so this is in so 200 total different pulsars. Um, and so the data sets in an in individual pulsar are small. And so some pulsars have glitched you know, quite a lot, but by quite a lot, what I'm meaning here is you know, 20 to maybe 50 glitches in the most glitchy pulsars. So the data sets are small, but, but they're sort of sizable enough to, for us to actually start you know, considering, well, what, what could be causing them. Of course, people were considering what could be causing glitches well before we had this number, when we only had a couple of people started thinking, well, well, what could, what could be spinning up a pulsar? Um, and, and there's many physical models that have survived the years of, of, of theory, um, uh, and they're sort of summarized in, in the, the good review paper by um, Bryn and Andrew in 2015. Um, and the sort of leading models um, sort of I've listed here, the sort of top three um, superfluid vortex avalanches, and I'm gonna go into the detail of this in, in a little bit um, towards the end of my talk. Um, star quakes, where you have um, you know, the, the, the crust um, breaking, um, and that breaking releases um, transfers angular momentum, um, which leads to a spin up um, or superfluid instabilities that somehow couple into the crust rotation frequency. Um, but for all these physical models, one of the key components for pretty much all of them is that there's some stress that builds up in the system in between glitches, and then at a glitch, that stress relaxes and releases. And that stress release couples into the cross to rotation frequency, and we see that as you know, an increase in the rotation frequency, a glitch. So there's the stress reservoir that's fluctuating. So the key question of a lot of our work, work that I've done with Andrew, is trying to answer, can we learn something about this underlying physics by looking at the statistics from individual pulsars? So looking at glitch sizes, waiting times between glitches, how they relate to one another, and can we sort of put them together in some way and relate them to the, these physical theoretical models? Um, the answer is yes, we can. We can do this. We can learn something, but it requires um, uh, 
uh, this thing that we, we call or have, have sort of dubbed uh, a meta model. And so if you can imagine this sort of, this is the state of the field of, of different physical models, models A through E, and they're related to each other through various ways. And one might be you know, almost a subset of the other or sort of you know, different parameter regime of one or the other. Um, and so you can see here, A, B, and C are all sort of interrelated with one another. And in fact, what we can do is create a set of rules which encodes the, the, the sort of fundamental belief or heuristic beliefs that, that these models um, really espoused. So what we're saying here is that you know, models A through C could be described by what we call a meta model. Um, and so if we can write down some simple rules about this meta model, how the stress increases and relaxes, um, and those rules sort of agree with models A, B, and C, then the predictions of the meta model are the predictions of all of the physical models that it contains. And so if we can look at the predictions of the meta model, we can compare that to observations. And if we can falsify the meta model, well, we can falsify the underlying physical models that that meta model, des that that meta -model describes. And of course, our state of the field could have different you know, meta models that we could construct. And I'm going to sort of introduce a couple of them towards the end of the slides today. Um, and you know, we can even start doing things like you know, meta model comparison, where we can say, well, you know, in certain pulsars, this, this second meta model doesn't quite work. Um, and so maybe we're starting to rule out some of the physical models. Um, so this is a little bit sort of high level. You know, what am I really saying here? What is a meta model precisely? Well, you know, we should start with the, the one that we uh, developed first, which is it's called the state dependent Poisson process. And so what this is, it's just a set of rules that describes an automaton of how stress accumulates and releases. So our stress here is X, it's a function of time. This stress is globally averaged. So global uniform stress that's felt everywhere in the star. You know, this assumption is a fairly large assumption. You might you know, quibble with that or ask questions about it, but hopefully I can convince you that this is not a terrible assumption, um, uh, uh, especially as a first pass for these, for these models. Um, it allows us to, to run them in a way that's sort of not uh, 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 tracking individual sites in the star, we're just doing some average stress across the star. So this stress X, um, it, it starts at some value and accumulates um, steadily, ramps up as a function of time, T, and then it, it releases um, certain amounts of it, delta XI, at glitches. And there's you know, some number of them um, up until time T. So obviously there's some pieces missing here. This, this isn't complete, it's not closed. Um, you know, how do we determine delta XI? Well, the size of each stress release event is governed by this distribution, this, this uh, PDF eta, um, which tells you the probability of getting a um, stress release of size delta x. And so you might say, well, what's, what is this distribution? What is this PDF? And you know, the answer you know, at face value is that it's unknown. Uh, we have to decide that. That's an input to this meta model. Uh, different choices of eta can be guided by what uh, physical model you're wanting to test. If you're thinking of some scale-free process, you might be thinking of putting in a power law for the stress release um, PDF. If you think that your, your physical process has some fundamental scale, then you might be thinking of putting in some sort of Gaussian. Um, and so you decide that as, as the sort of user of this meta model. You can, you can tweak that as you see fit, um, but, but you know, at, at face value, it is an input parameter to the meta model soon see that there aren't actually that many knobs to tweak. There aren't that many input parameters. Um, and so we also say that this, this distribution is, uh, depends on the stress just prior to the glitch. And we do this to make sure that we don't release more stress than is actually in the system at the time of a glitch, because um, we, we don't want negative stresses for, for obvious reasons, hopefully. So the other piece of the puzzle, the other way to make this automaton run is we need to decide when glitches happen. How often do they happen? You know, what, what causes a glitch? When, when do we decide to have one? Well, that's, this is what's decided with the state dependent bit of this, the state dependent Poisson. You know, why does it have this name? Is we're saying that uh, glitches are triggered stochastically, they're triggered randomly. We're saying that the, the waiting time um, is determined by a state dependent Poisson process. And so the instantaneous rate of having a glitch is uh, proportional to one on one minus X. So we're saying that 
as our stress increases, we're more and more likely to get the glitch. Um, and, and up until you know, a critical point, a critical stress, where we're certain to have a glitch. And so this is the sort of maths, the simple maths behind this automaton. Um, you know, what does this look like? You know, graphically, we can, we can sort of have a look at this three panel plot where in the top panel, we've got our stress in red and it's ramping up linearly time and releases some amount of it at each glitch uh, determined by that automaton on the previous slide. In the middle panel, we've got our instantaneous rate. You can see this is just a simple transform of our stress. And we, when we have higher stress, we have a higher instantaneous glitch rate. Excuse me, sorry. And then our, in our bottom panel, we're starting to see some potential observables. So I want to emphasize that we don't, we can't actually see the stress in a star, in the neutron star. All we can see are glitches. And really what we're boiling the glitches down to are the size of the glitch and the waiting time. And so what we've said here is that the size of the stress release event is linearly proportional to the size of the uh, increase in rotational frequency of the crust. If we make that assumption, we can, we can see that they're coupled when, when we have stress release events, we have increases in the, the angular frequency of the crust. And we can start making comparisons to data. Um, so let's just sort of sum up the state dependent Poisson meta model. You know, what's the appeal? Yeah, there's a few, few reasons why, why this, is, this model is so appealing. Um, one of which is that there's only a few dials. You might think of this as a sort of drawback of, well, you know, it doesn't encode the physics precisely of every, every model that I think of, um, but actually this is a strength. Um, the, 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 the lack of sort of flexibility or you know, apparent lack of flexibility means that the few controls parameters that it does have can be related um, uh, often in somewhat loose ways to, to some underlying physics. So for example, this, this control parameter alpha is, is uh, inversely proportional to the to the torque. Um, and so if you have a fast driven system, um, you know, your, your star is spinning down uh, uh, rapidly, then alpha will be low. Um, uh, uh, modulo some other uh, parameters, not all of which are observable. <laughs> um, for details, uh, obviously, see, see the details of the paper. I don't have time to, to go into all of them here. Um, the other you know, dial that it has is the functional form of eta, which I've already described, how that can relate to the physics um, that you're wanting to test, the, the underlying theoretical model that you want to test. And you know, the, the major thing that I want to stress here is that an appeal of writing down these simple automatons is that we can make predictions. Solving and generating new glitches is easy when we just have a simple model like this. We can pick a waiting time, pick a size, pick a waiting time, pick a size, and repeat a million times on your laptop in a couple of seconds. And so from that, we can generate um, predictions. Um, what, are, what is the distribution of waiting times? What is the distribution of um, glitch sizes uh, from this meta model? What are the cross correlations between the glitch size and waiting times, or even order correlations? And so you know, just to, go into this a little bit, um, we should sort of first describe a little bit what we actually see in pulsars. Um, so first of all, let's, let's describe you know, these PDFs of, uh, of waiting times and sizes. And so when we look in individual pulsars, we can generally, you know, broadly speaking, see two main classes. Um, and of course, there are some in between. Um, but, but one of these classes of pulsars is these things are sometimes called Poisson-like. It's because they have exponentially distributed waiting times. So you can see in these kernel density estimates of PDFs here in blue, um, the top panels. And then in the bottom panels, you can see that the size distributions or the fractional glitch size distributions are, are roughly speaking power laws for these Poisson-like class. Um, the other class of, of pulsar, of glitching pulsars are sometimes called quasi-periodic because they seem to have some preferred scale for both the waiting times. Um, you can see here with Vela, roughly three years. Um, uh, and, and the glitch size distributions are also roughly unimodal. And so one key question is, can the state dependent Poisson process generate these distributions or these shapes of distributions? You know, can we choose an alpha and an eta and can we generate these PDFs? The answer seems to be, broadly speaking, yes. And this is without fine tuning, without fitting. 
So it's just yeah, finding some values that roughly seem to work just to show that we can generate both classes um, uh, self-consistently within the same framework, which is kind of a new step. Um, uh, previous frameworks have either focused on you know, generating something that has you know, parallel distributed sizes, um, uh, but, but you know, doesn't inside the same framework generate these quasi-periodic glitches. Okay, so that's one potential observable, these, these PDFs. Another one are, are cross-correlations. Um, and so the intuition we should be having here is that, well, we've got- uh, you, you have still eight minutes to go. Okay, cool. Um, the intuition that we have here is that if we have a large glitch and we're you know, emptying our stress reservoir, well, maybe we're gonna have a large waiting time after that to fill up the reservoir again before likely able to, to have the next glitch. This would mean that we have a forward cross-correlation large glitch, large waiting time. Yeah. We might also say, okay, if we had a large waiting time, maybe we built up a lot of stress during that time, and we're more likely to have a larger glitch because we have a larger stress reservoir to, to empty. This would result in a backward cross-correlation. Um, but, but these sort of intuitions are really only true if the stress reservoir is depleted at each event, um, uh, which isn't necessarily true in, in this state of pen framework. So you know, first of all, let's see what we see in real pulsars. Um, and so these are sort of six of the most glitching pulsars. And what we mostly see is that you know, with the dashed orange line, uh, uh, all of, all of, pretty much all of the pulsars are consistent with no cross correlations, either forward or backward. There are a couple that have some forward cross correlations that are you know, inconsistent with zero, but, but obviously more data are needed to, to make this more certain and 0537 being the, the exception in a lot of ways as always. Um, uh, I don't have time to go into why we've plotted them with this abscissa, um, but, but uh, feel free to ask me in the question time. Um, so what do we see from the state dependent Poisson process? Do we generate forward and backward cross correlations ever? The answer is yes, but it does depend on alpha and eta. You know, I've got two different alphas in the left and right panel, uh, two different etas in the left and right panel and plot as a function of alpha here, the forward and the backward. And you can see in different alpha regimes, we'll get a certain combination forward and backward cross correlations. So this is the one of the key strengths is that we've actually got a combination of tests that we can apply to observational data to falsify or try to falsify the metamodel. So let's do this. Let's combine the tests. You know, let's pick 0537 as our, our favorite pulsar with most glitches. Um, so we need to find a regime with the metamodel which can predict all of the long-term stats I just talked about, uh, waiting time distributions and glitch sizes. And you can see that you know, blue is the observational data, orange is our, our uh, meta model with a certain input alpha and eta. Um, that seems to match okay. Uh, uh, and then in the, the right panel here, I've got the, the cross correlations. Uh, the solid lines are, are the meta model predictions for different models of alpha. Dashed is the observations with the band around the dashed line, the error bar of the observation. You can see there's a certain region in low values of alpha, um, highlighted in blue here, where, where the forward and backward cross correlations are um, uh, consistent. And this value of alpha predicts those sort of orange lines in the left panels. So we have found a combination of input parameters in the meta model, which can predict our data. But I have to say that this is not always possible. This is not always possible for all pulsars, for all the two pulsars, or for all meta models. The state dependent Poisson process turns out is fairly flexible. It allows for a broad range of observable of combinations of observables, but um, it's not infinitely flexible. Um, a few other uh, 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 potential uh, meta models. You know, we we don't have to have this state dependent. We don't have to have this linear ramp up and and um, uh, small you know stress releases. We could instead have a, a, a Brownian stress accumulation process, where instead of our stress ramp ramping up linearly, we have our stress building up stochastically with a Brownian walk and with some drift component and some diffusion component. And, and this sort of meta model is motivated by uh, observations of Vila um, or observations of timing noise um, uh, and, and has some uh, slightly more vague physical motivations, but, but we can write down the rules for this meta model. We can you know, run the automaton, we can generate waiting times and generate glitch sizes and see what it predicts. Yeah, it looks like you know this if we compare it to the state dependent um, on the left panels and the right panels the Brownian stress accumulation 
So it's got this sort of stochastic walk up until it reaches a threshold where which is triggered. You know, on the bottom panel by I, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference just you know, looking at the, the cross rotation. Um, but of course, there's statistics associated with this. Um, and we can, we can look at what are the long-term predictables from this Brownian stress accumulation metamodel. Um, and then briefly sort of summarizing them, this, this metamodel predicts forward cross correlations, you know, large forward cross correlations with no other correlations seen. Um, and it doesn't have as flexible waiting time and size distributions as the state dependent. And so we can actually already falsify this in some pulsars, which is exciting. Um, you know, and in some recent work, we've we've specialized the state dependent Poisson process even further, where we instead of choosing eta sort of by fiat exogenously, we sort of determine it internally. We we specialize this to the superfluid vortex avalanche model and say that there are um, uh, pinning sites which have different stress thresholds, and we track the distribution of which pinning sites are occupied and which aren't. And uh, combined with the state dependent Poisson process, we can determine the sizes of glitches um, uh, uh, purely deterministically once we've determined the waiting times and therefore the, the stress in the system at each glitch. I don't have time, I don't think, to go into the details of how we do this, um, but just to show you a pretty picture, um, we can see at different sort of values of the control parameter, we have different sort of uh, uh, phenomenological behavior of how the stress accumulates over time. Um, when we've specialized this meta model. Um, and again, like the Brownian stress accumulation meta model, we might have all already falsified it um, because this meta model, uh, for many, many um, combinations of possible control parameters, doesn't, uh, the, 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 the meta model predicts forward cross correlations, and we broadly don't see that in many pulsars. Um, and again, like the Brownian stress accumulation one, has, has somewhat hard to reconcile PDFs of waiting times and sizes. And there are, um, of course, telltale, telltale signatures of this and the other meta models, um, which we can look for in actual observational data. And so to quickly conclude, apologies for going slightly over time, um, the, this idea of meta modeling, you know, these phenomenological models of stress accumulation and relaxation, provide a mathematical framework to predict, to make predictions that are falsifiable, that we can relate to actual observations of which waiting times and sizes. And you know, for the for maybe not the first time, but in a very precise way, we can link theoretical models to observations, um, not on individual glitches, you know, not looking at the sort of detailed, you know, how the how the frequency evolves at the glitch itself, but looking at a sequence of glitches. And so we've provisionally falsified both the Brownian stress accumulation and this uh, specialization uh, into the, the superfluid vortex meta model. Um, and, and this provisional falsification means that at least one of the following statements are true. Either our glitch data sets are incomplete, and work has been going, going into trying to make, trying to quantify this, trying to work out what is the smallest glitch we can see. Um, and for more details on that, see uh, Liam's talk uh, uh, later in the week, I think on Friday, Liam Dunn. Um, sorry for not having a link here. Uh, so either the glitch data sets are incomplete or we have actually falsified the, the stochastic stress accumulation idea. Glitches are not triggered by that, maybe. Or they're not triggered by superfluid vortex avalanches. That, that is one possibility. Or Maybe we've missed some fundamental detail in, in these physical models, which impacts our predictables in, in a non-trivial way. You know, maybe the, the spatial correlations between sites are important, um, and our globally average stress maybe doesn't capture this adequately. Um, and so there are a few possibilities here, but, but you know, importantly, one of these possibilities is that we've falsified the, the you know, belief that's widely held in the literature that Glitches are triggered by superfluid vortex avalanches. Um, and thank apologies you. for going slightly over time, but thank you. Thanks, uh, Julia, for this inspiring talk. Uh, just checking if there are questions. I was just wondering uh, 
how many glitches you really need uh, for giving a statistical uh, uh, statistical meaningful uh, answer to, to your approach for 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 a, a given pulsar or for the whole answer? yeah it's 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 a good question um so the answer is if we want to falsify them you know we can make do with just the 20 glitches that we've seen in some pulsars in some pulsars we have already falsified some meta models. Um, if we want to do um, uh, a parameter estimation, you know, actually sort of precisely estimate the parameters of these meta, meta models, this has been sort of attempted, and sort of initial attempts have been have been done um, by Andrew and um, uh, uh, one of his former students, uh, Lisa Drummond. Um, uh, and the answer is it's tricky, and you probably need of order hundreds of glitches to be able to be better at predicting the future than if you had just assumed a, a simple Poisson model. Uh, uh, but but uh, yeah, that's the rough number. You're looking for hundreds of glitches to be to making really to be able to make really precise statements. For each specific source, of course. Yeah, in an individual pulsar. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's 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 trickier to combine data from different pulsars because they may have different fundamental parameters that are determining how this meta model evolves, you know, there the spin down rate might be really important, but also say the temperature or uh, or other properties that could affect things like the pinning strength of pinning sites, um, which might vary pulsar to pulsar, which you know combines in a, a potentially tricky way to to produce one of the the parameters of the meta model. Thanks, Julian. Thanks again. <clears throat> uh, there will be other talks about a similar um, subject in the. In the Friday session um, uh, of Neutron Star 3 plus Neutron Star 5. Um, uh, at the moment, we have to come back to the now last one uh, contribution of this morning, uh, European morning. Uh, come back to Michele Majorano. Uh, yes, uh, do you use, hear me? Uh, about five minutes of uh, his uh, allocation. So I think that you, you can share again your screen and start again from where you you left. Take in mind that you have 20 minutes as a whole. I'll give you a warning when eight minutes will be left. Don't be worried that someone may be joined and not hearing your first few slides because all of this is recorded. So people will be able to, to come back to, to hear uh, what you uh, talked about at the beginning uh, uh, without any uh, arm for the, for the logic of the talk. So okay. please go ahead. Maybe you, can, uh, you, you, you yes. Okay. Maybe you can also keep uh, your camera switched off for avoiding. Uh, uh, yes, 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 yes. It is a good idea. Okay. Uh, so, um, the, the first part was simply uh, a brief, uh, uh, I, I was uh, briefly talk, talking about uh, pulsar timing arrays and uh, the possibility to detect gravitational waves uh, from supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, so this is possible uh, just uh, only if we have um, a lot of pulsars because uh, with a single pulsar, we, we can't, uh, um, say that the timing residuals that we uh, we observe are due only to gravitational wave signal, or uh, if they, they are due uh, to other uh, effects, um, uh, other kind of effects. So we need a large number of pulsars, and we we need to observe a correlation in the timing residuals of uh, each pulsar. Uh, and this correlation, uh, if it is uh, um, induced by uh, a gravitational wave signal, must uh, follow the endings and downs curve uh, that is described by the picture on the left, where the C angle is the angle between the two uh, pulsars that we are considering for uh, the correlation. So we see that if the pulsars are close, they are very correlated. Uh, the current situation is that uh, even if uh, we have already the sensitivity to detect uh, the gravitational wave background, 
Uh, however, uh, the, um, the main pulsar timing arrays collaboration that are uh, European pulsar timing array, uh, Parks pulsar timing array, and the Narogav uh, have, have only found some uh, clues of common process uh, spectrum, but no strong evidences of the quadrupolar cross correlation that I uh, have shown in the previous slide. Uh, so uh, the possible reasons uh, behind that is that uh, maybe we need uh, more years of data uh, or more pulsars to observe, or maybe the quadrupolar course correlation is suppressed by other effects. And uh, the, the worst scenario is the last parsec problem is real. The last parsec problem uh, can be explained saying that uh, uh, a supermassive black hole binaries to reach the coalescence phase um, uh, 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 to lose energy. Uh, uh, this lose energy by uh, dynamical friction, but uh, um, in the last step, uh, uh, dynamical friction uh, is not enough to, to shrink the, um, the binary. And uh, the gravitational wave in this step uh, is, is, um, are still not, not active. Uh, so this is the last parsec problem. So we don't know how uh, the binary uh, reach the separation needed to uh, produce the gravitational wave that we want to observe. Uh, so we need uh, uh, another other tools uh, to confirm uh, uh, that the correlation that we observe uh, are due the gravitational waves. Uh, we need another smoking gun, let's say. So uh, one possibility is to, to return back to the theory. Uh, we can notice that uh, the correlation function came uh, from the ensemble average of the pulse uh, shift caused by uh, the, the gravitational waves. Uh, in the standard uh, approximation, the K factor um, that you can see uh, that is dependent on the pulsar term and the earth term, uh, it goes to one because uh, in the standard approximation, uh, the pulsars are, are not uh, correlated because are in two different uh, places of the space time. But uh, um, wh what, happens, uh, what happens if we consider two pulsars that are very, very close? Uh, it happens that uh, the correlation, um, it, it is double uh, with, respect the, the, with respect to the previous one. Because in this case, uh, since the, the two pulsars are in the same place, uh, the correlation, uh, the, the pulsars are uh, co correlated, of course. So this is a special case, but uh, uh, maybe it is not so special because uh, even if uh, the probability to have uh, two millisecond pulsars in almost the same sp position, the, the space is uh, zero by chance. Uh, in the globular cluster, uh, clusters, we have a lot of millisecond pulsars um, enclosed within a sm very small radius from their center. Uh, so here I reported a couple of noticeable uh, examples as uh, Terzan 5 and uh, 47 Tukane. Uh, okay, so we, um, in, in, uh, in our work, we considered um, a simulated, uh, let's say, uh, globular cluster uh, core um, with uh, the parameters uh, typical of Terzan 5. Uh, so we used uh, 5.9 kiloparsec uh, of the, for distance. Uh, we used uh, uh, 0.16 arcominutes for uh, the core radius. And uh, we used uh, um, uh, 15 millisecond pulsars. Uh, so we simulated uh, the scale coordinates uh, of uh, the globular cluster of uh, the each millisecond pulsar so, uh, enclosed in the core. Uh, so, uh, and also we simulated uh, a population of supermassive black hole binaries. Uh, and uh, using uh, uh, the, the formula on the left, on the right, we calculated uh, um, the 
uh, induced gravitational wave time residual uh, of uh, each uh, supermassive core binaries on each pulsar of the um, globular cluster. Uh, in this case, we use the, uh, the non-evolving binary approximation. So um, in, uh, in our case, it is justified because uh, we can say that uh, the supermassive black hole binary, uh, binary don't evo uh, doesn't evolve uh, in the time, uh, in the travel time of the um, emitted uh, pulse uh, from the millisecond pulsar uh, to the Earth. So uh, these are the distribution uh, of uh, the chirp mass, uh, the distance and the frequency that we have considered. And uh, the last one is the resulting strain uh, distribution that is of the order of uh, 10 at raised uh, minus 16 as, uh, as one expects uh, from uh, uh, gravitational wave background. We simulated the position inside the, the core of this, uh, let's say, simulated Tarsan 5 uh, globular cluster. Uh, and uh, on the right, uh, we can see uh, the distribution uh, of uh, the supermassive black hole binaries in black. And uh, the blue dot is the, the globular cluster. So uh, using uh, all these data, uh, we simulated uh, the resulting time residuals uh, due to the uh, all the contribution from all the supermassive black hole binaries on uh, each pulsars of the globular cluster. As you can see, uh, all these curves uh, are very, very similar. Uh, they, have, they have essentially the same shape. Uh, so uh, this is uh, um, a, a strong thing because uh, uh, this says that uh, uh, if we observe the same shape uh, for each uh, global clusters uh, pulses, maybe this, this can be uh, to uh, a gravitational wave signal. This is what we observe in a campaign of 10 years that is a uh, uh, about uh, it is similar uh, of similar duration of um, current observing campaign uh, uh, that is uh, about uh, 15 years, let's say. As, and uh, also here uh, we, can see, we can see that uh, all the timing residuals are very, very close each other. And uh, this is a comparison with a real observation uh, for, uh, for a pulsar of uh, the uh, monitored by nanogram collaboration. Uh, as we can see, uh, we already observe this uh, sinusoidal modulation uh, in our data. But uh, at the state of the art, we can't say nothing uh, only with just one pulsar. Uh, so, uh, this is not enough to say that um, this modulation is due gravitational wave, uh, but uh, our proposal is that uh, if we consider 10 pulsar, uh, let's say 15 pulsar inside uh, a globular cluster like Tarzan 5, and if we see the same sinusoidal shape uh, with the same maximum, uh, the same minim, uh, minimum uh, in each uh, timing residuals. This is a strong evidence that uh, a gravitational wave uh, induced the, 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 that uh, timing residuals. Uh, the fact that, uh, that we, we have uh, not a single pulsar uh, make possible also to use it, the it, surfing. Sorry, we can Eight minutes. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, the, the fact that uh, we have uh, 15 pulsars uh, instead of one make possible also to use the, the, the so-called surfing effect. The surfing effect is uh, an effect that uh, is already known in literature. And uh, um, according to that, uh, the, uh, the timing residual signal is enhanced when uh, the um, gravitational wave source and the, um, the pulsar are aligned each other. 
So uh, in this case, in fact, we see that uh, on the x-axis is it is plot the alignment between the gravitational wave direction and the pulsar. So uh, in this case, the, the angle uh, of maximum timing residual is about uh, pi. Uh, so this means that uh, the, black, the supermassive black hole binaries, uh, binary and the pulsar uh, are uh, align, aligned, are divided by an angle uh, given by zero, essentially. So uh, this means that under a, a, a certain threshold, maybe we can't observe anything. So even if we, even uh, if, if we, uh, all the, the supermassive black hole binaries co uh, contribute to the signal, uh, we only see essentially with our, our instruments only the the one that the ones that are more aligned with the the this this global the global cluster that we are considering. So, uh, but if we consider just a single pulsar, as I said before, we can say nothing because. If we observe a sinusoidal modulation, it can be due to other effects, uh, like, for example, errors in, in the uh, calibration of clocks, uh, etc. So uh, this, uh, this effect uh, may help to uh, also to localize, the, to localize uh, a single uh, continuous gravitational wave source. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, until now, I considered only uh, the advantages, but of course, the, there are uh, other complications uh, due to the fact uh, that the um, global cluster has a gravitational field uh, that can uh, influence the millisecond pulsar uh, dynamics. So it has, be, uh, it has to be modeled with uh, an high degree of precision. And uh, uh, also there is another problem due to the fact that uh, the pulsar in, uh, used in pulsar timing arrays are usually uh, very, very close, uh, while uh, uh, globular clusters are uh, more, uh, more, dis more distant. Uh, so the dispersion measure, measure is more important in this case. So we have uh, some problems. In fact, uh, until now, global cluster pulsars are not included in uh, pulsar timing arrays, but uh, um, we hope that uh, in, in the future, we will be able to, to overcome these problems. Uh, so this led me to conclusions. As I said uh, just a moment before, it is very difficult to reach the, the, pre the precision of uh, 100 nanoseconds that is required to observe uh, the timing residuals uh, induced by gravitational wave. But uh, uh, next generation radio telescopes, right, like uh, the, for example, the square kilometer array, uh, may improve the time accuracy to the up to the, re the required level. Uh, so, uh, using instead uh, of uh, uh, many pulsars in uh, different position of the sky, using a, um, a globular cluster that contains many pulsars in a, a very, very small angle will help uh, both the gravitational wave background detection and uh, uh, maybe the detection of continuous gravitational waves. So, thank you. Thanks, Michele. Very interesting talk. Uh, so time, uh, we have uh, four minutes of time for uh, questions. Uh, had you the possibility to, uh, to evaluate uh, um, the effect uh, of, of the globular cluster potential well on uh, uh, perturbing your uh, um, the coherence of, uh, of, uh, of the time residual signature in a, in a given globular cluster? 
um, the, well, uh, the, the presence of the, the gravitational well uh, due to the globular cluster um, may modify uh, the, uh, the timing model that, uh, as you certainly know, is, uh, uh, can, can be treated as a, um, a Taylor expansion of uh, the time of arrivals. And uh, this, is, uh, this, this, this can lead to, to some correction to, to the timing model. So uh, to account the, the, um, the presence of the field, we have to, to model also the dynamics of, um, of the pulsars, uh, of course. But uh, um, in, in the talk uh, that uh, of Federico Abate, if I remember well, um, I think that uh, um, we are going in a good direction to, to get a better model uh, of globular clusters. You need, uh, you will be helped uh, by the specific three-dimensional position of the millisecond pulsar in the global, in the specific globular cluster, or you, you're only. It is, it is more the acceleration that that, uh, that um, it, it is the problem. The acceleration of uh, each pulsar, and the and also the distance between the the globular clusters, the globular cluster and the solar system barycenter that is uh, larger than uh, the distance uh, between uh, 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 the, the pulsar that are used commonly in pulsar timing arrays that are of the order of one kiloparsec or even less. Thank you, Michele. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I don't see. In, in that case, uh, I think uh, it's time for a uh, uh, thank uh, uh, for thanking again all, all the speakers of this uh, very interesting uh, session. We uh, touched the many different aspects of uh, uh, pulsar uh, science, and uh, so uh, <clears throat> applause to to everyone. Um, I'm also happy to see that uh, we, we have reached uh, uh, a good attendance to this uh, meeting, more than 20 people sometimes, and more than 15 uh, uh, in average. Um, so I give you uh, appointment for uh, uh, Friday, uh, when uh, uh, there will be another uh, session of this uh, same uh, meeting uh, mostly devoted uh, to um, again to um, glitches and to um, uh, use of uh, pulsars uh, uh, in fundamental physics uh, when dealing with uh, um, high energy uh, data for the for the time being uh, i think uh, uh, after having uh, 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 saying hello to, to you all, we can close uh, this uh, session and uh, have a nice day or night or evening, uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.